Hey, thanks for doing the podcast. Pleasure. It's good to be here finally. Yeah, it's been a little while. Yeah. But I'm really grateful for you taking your time out. Um, if we could go back to how you got on the den and how that came about, I mean, it won't be the focus of the interview, but I always find it fascinating. Did you chase it? Was it something that came to you? How did it all happen? Well, yeah, maybe a longer podcast. So, so I started out um, a professional background and I sort of did quite well. I was a comprehensive school kid that managed to become a, a sort of a private equity lawyer in the city, then investment banker at Credit Suisse. So I was in my ivory tower in Canary Wharf. I was earning more money than I could spend by the time I was 25. And then up through that, I could have got into business. And then I had a couple of businesses, some did okay. And then through that, I was noticed to be on the power list, which is the most influential, the 100 most influential black Britons. So through mm. that, I was sort of on the radar of various people and researchers and various media companies. And I was approached to do The Secret Millionaire. People forget that. I was actually on the, I was a mm. secret millionaire. This is like 2011. Uh, people, a lot of my friends said, well, you really did keep that secret. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, so I've done a secret millionaire. And that was interesting because that was, um, it was quite personal. It was quite a sort of um, quite hard thing to do. Um, and I, I was quite reluctant about doing it in a way, but I thought, you know, I was 40 then. I thought, why not just do it? I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of a yes person. Pardon? Why were you reluctant? Because I wasn't sure about being a celebrity, but I kind of thought this is a one-off thing really. It's on TV once and you either see it or you don't. So I did that and actually I ended up in prison, a young offenders institution. And I I was in there and I I was more interested in the the inmates, the prisoners, than the kind of charities in a way. And uh, another side story, but one of the guys I met there, young black lad, if he was born in Hampstead, he would have been working at Morgan Stanley. He wasn't, he was in prison for 11 years, drugs and firearms. So I kind of helped him when he got out trained him in IT, he worked for me, I made him redundant, which was a bit of an awkward day. <laughs> and then he, after I supported him a little bit and we've always stayed in touch, and he's now probably earning 40, 50 grand a year. He's got a, a lovely partner and a kid. Right. So, but you can't scale that. No. Anyway, so I did that. Then through that, I was um, approached by the BBC to, do you want to go in Dragon's Den? So the first year they approached me, I kind of thought it was my mates, literally. One of my mates said they were pranksters. I thought, literally, <laughs> my friend Damien, I'd be a bit of a laugh. <laughs> Whatever. That's the sort of thing you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And you do a good job of it as well. Yeah. So I kind of like, thought, well, really? And I was kind of aware at the time. And they kept talking to me and it kind of went away. And I think, mm. um, I think Hilary DeVay or someone joined them, whatever it was. Yeah. And then a, a year later, they approached me again. So now I'm thinking, you know, do, do I do this? I had a business. I never really had a B2C business. It wasn't something on the high street. I could go on TV and flog. Yeah. And I was kind of B2B. So I thought, do, do I do it? Do I, what do I do? And then at the time, uh, a bit before that, I was um, at the Tech Track Awards and Sir Richard Branson, Virgin, sponsored it. And he was on stage saying, who wants to come to meet Ulu Saba? This is a private game reserve on a Connect trip with Virgin Unite. You know, you, you can, if you've got to, you've got to give a bit of a donation, probably like a 9-11. And I kind of thought, nah, I only live once, so I put my hand up. Yeah. So fast forward, I'm in Ulu Saba with Sir Richard Branson and his private game reserve, which is like a like a James Bond lair. If you can ever afford to go there, go. Yeah. Beautiful place in, in the kind of bush. And I'm sitting there thinking, and the BBC keep ringing me. Are you going to do it? Are you going to do what we need to know? And I'm thinking, who can I talk to about the media, business, how you combine the two, the pros, the cons? Is it a good thing to do? And clearly the answer was Sir Richard. Mm. And he sort of came over and said, he literally said, I'm not making any of this up. He said, are you, are you okay? And I was like, well, I've got a bit of an issue. He goes, let's have a chat. We had a corona these kind of uh, lions chasing these animals around below us, which is quite sort of metaphorical. And I kind of said, right, well, I kind of laid it all out. And he said, look, cut a long story short. He said, look, screw it, just do it, as you, as you would expect. You knew he was going to say that. <laughs> but he, but, but he kind of went through the whole thing about the media and the pros and the cons. And the interesting point he made was, is that, you know, we, and we do a lot about social media, is that social media is great. At the end of the day, he used to get on a plane to a decent TV spot on the news or something because it's so powerful. And he said, look, you should do it. You think you'd be good at it, you're different. And I kind of said, okay, great. And he said, do it then. I said, well, I will do it. He goes, no, now. <laughs> and he made me ring the producer back right. and say, I'm in. And he sort of went, ching, with Corona, yeah. and wandered off. <laughs> and that was how I ended up on Dragon's Den. And not that's, right. that's the truth. That's a good story. That's a good story. I didn't expect it, it to be quite that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's a great story. But then, so I think so I'll come back. I just quickly ask yeah. you something about that before we carry that on. Um, you said Richard gave you some advice on, you know, the upsides and downsides. What was that advice? Well, I guess the, the upside is, is, that, is that you it gives you profile and, you know, profile has its, has its ups and downs as well. So it's good in many ways. People recognise you. It's bad in many ways because people recognise yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and the profile, it can open doors. 
But I think with what you're, you're laying yourself out to the, the public. So I've, you know, I've, I've had my ups and downs, I've had the press, you know, you've, I've had the blue, you know, the sort of red tops, you've been through all of that. But I think overall it's a, it's a positive thing. The, yeah. the main downside for me, I think, is that people think I'm some kind of helicopter riding billionaire that rides riding Maybachs, and, and I'm not at all. Mm. So they kind of create this caricature of you almost, which isn't me. And sometimes when I meet people or I deal with people, I have to break it down a bit. When I do things on social media, and all the time it's kind of like, is that you? Is that peers or is that a team? Yeah. I'm kind of like, no, it's me. Well, I'm, I'm a team. It's yeah. like, it's me. I can't, you know, you can't, I can't allow some intern in the PR department to write this stuff because it's quite personal. Yeah. So it's kind of that. But it, and overall, he said it's a positive thing for, for business. Now, I think, it's, I think it's more helpful if you've got a B2C business. So you've got something that people can actually recognize you. They can go on your website, look at it, and then buy something. Yeah. And if you're selling, you know, chip sets to Apple, it's not really going to help no. you. So in that Unless way, you want a profile for keynote speaking. For the profile. Do, so yeah. I do keynote speaker. I kind of started doing that more recently, mm. and that's more because I, I kind of enjoy it. Yeah. Um, but I think the, the main thing for me was was that it allows you to do some good as well. So the profiles. When I was on Dragons Den, I struggled a little bit with you know who am I? I went through that. I was also forty, so maybe it was a midlife crisis. <laughs> so I went through that thinking, you know, who am I? And I kind of thought, well, when people say who's Piers Linney, I think they find it quite hard to pigeonhole me. Is he this like you know tech entrepreneur? Most of my tech was enterprise tech, really. Is he some you know sort of um, diversity champion? Who is he? Is he some like you know comprehensive school boy done well? Most people think I was a puppet school kid as well. They couldn't work me out. Mm. So I sort of said, right, I'm about really you know technology champion entrepreneurs, especially small businesses generally, because not all small business owners are entrepreneurs. Yeah, being an entrepreneur is a different thing. Um, diversity, inclusion, social mobility. But I decided really to champion what, who am I in terms of how I got to where I was yeah. and trying to make that path easier for lots of other people because it wasn't an easy one. Right. So it's been great for that in terms of um, charitable work, philanthropy. I'm on the board of Nesta, which is the UK's largest innovation charity. We've got a £450 million endowment. I'm on the board of British Business Bank, the Government Bank, which I love. Yeah. And we've put about over £12 billion now facilitated into UK SMEs. Wow. So... That kind of stuff I wouldn't get to do yeah. if I wasn't, hadn't been on TV, I guess. Sure. That, that's a positive side of it. Yeah. And the negative side, you have to just manage it. But you see a lot of people on these, you know, the Love Islands of the world, that, you know, they, suddenly you're famous for 15 minutes, then you're not. You earn a couple hundred grand. As you all know, you earn 200 grand. You spend 250. You, well, you don't get 200 of that <laughs> well, 200 might, grand, do you? Well, you don't. You probably might get 80. Probably get 80. Yeah. But then you spend 100, and I yeah. think you're a millionaire. Yeah. And the next week, you're nobody again. So that can be very hard to deal with. And I... I I was a reluctant celebrity in a way, and I went cold really for about two years. It was so only, you didn't really leverage it. In I that didn't. Room. And you probably noticed I suddenly, but he helps peers in it. I appeared again on LinkedIn or somewhere. Yeah. Well, what's he doing there? And um, it was more. I kind of thought after two years, what do I do with this? It's going to go cold, and that's not a good thing. I should do something with it. My partner said to me, "No, you should. You know, just put stuff out there mm. that, that's personal." And I did that. I wasn't really selling anything, and uh, the feedback was great. So that's the positive side of it. But I think the, the big thing about what I constantly think about is what do you do with it? Because you are recognisable. You, you are seen to champion certain things. And it's about how do you scale that? Yeah. And, and you know, also how do you do that in a way where, in another way, you can leverage your profile to amass attention. And with attention, you can so sell things and make money. Social media so nowadays, I'm not going to hide the fact that, you know, eventually that's what I'd like to do. But in a way which is consistent with you know me and where I like to do things. So a couple of things that came up from that. Um, you said, who is, here's Linny, and you had this, not identity crisis, but you didn't really know. I never thought about yeah. it. Yeah, now you had to, because you had a PR company saying, well, who are you? Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Well, so who are you? So who am I? So I kind of looked at it and said, right, what are the three things that I kind of keep it also three things, really, three things. So one is, Business-wise, people think I'm sort of, you know, some billionaire. I'm not. I'm very much still in the game. Um, I've made money in my last business. I lost money on it. So I did my friends and various other people. So that wasn't ideal at all. Um, but you live and learn. And now I'm looking at starting the next business. So as a, in business, I am interested in power of technology, the future of work, you know, disruption. Yeah. And I've been looking at what can I do, this is what I've been beavering away on, for my next thing. Yeah. I want the next thing to be quite a big thing. Um, and again, when you're well-known, 
there's a risk in your back of your head thinking, well, if I go out with something, and just, let's face it, right, you're an entrepreneur, it's an hypothesis. I'm a big believer in that. And you test it, and you do your utmost to make it work, but every hypothesis proves to be correct. And that's, that's a failure in entrepreneurs. Mm. That's what entrepreneurs face. That's not a bad thing, that's the process. Yeah. But when you're well known, I think it's a fear sometimes of going out with something, that everyone expects you just to you work because you, you're, you're a genius. Yeah. And you've got more to lose as well. So I kind of got over that. So that's business. In terms of um, philanthropy and things that I sort of believe in, it's very much about my story. So I was a comprehensive school kid, ended up in the city, and that was a very difficult path to make. So for me to go to university, I kind of expected to. I had my parents that kind of are very supportive. They were my role models, they were my only role models ever, really. Got into university, <clears throat> took me 60 applications to get into law. I got one offer get into the city really? and that was like an egg timer it was like that it was like really difficult there was that restriction i got through yeah. and then it was a meritocracy it was a huge mm. opportunity for me so i kind of look look back and say i didn't have a clue right when i said to people when i grew up i grew up in a mill town in lancashire i want to be in business they said well what do i do to become an accountant i was like oh right okay yeah. so i did an accounting a law degree because quite like law uh, and but no one really knew they were in business my neighbors but they were all kind of quarry builders, joiners, those kind of businesses. And my dad worked in um, for a large ceramics business. My mum was a nurse and health visitor. So I kind of look back and say, in that respect, it's about that journey, about social mobility. As far as I'm concerned, society is not fair until the top of it looks like the bottom of it, so that pyramid. And I've worked in the city. I've been to events in the city where I've walked in as a CEO of a public company and someone said to me, I'll have two gin and tonics and a Malibu and orange. You know, I won a, I was a, not a winner actually, I was a regional finalist in a very large um, entrepreneur award, which is a very large accountancy firm runs. I get to reception and then with my, my bag and my coat and I walk in, they say I'll go and hang it up out the back and I'm walking in and I, I hang them up, I'm walking out, two other finalists give me their bag and coat because no one expected me, the CEO, to look like me. It doesn't happen so much now, but I go to meetings where I sit down and everyone's Filing the nails, checking Instagram, ringing their mum, checking the, the home CCTV camera. I said, we're going to start the meeting. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just going to wait for peers. So that's got to change. Mm. So I focus a lot on that, yeah. about social mobility and diversity and, and inclusion as well. Do you think that gives you a bit of an advantage? Because in um, a way you can be a bit more stealthy and out of war about how you approach business. I wish, I, like, I, wish I was that bright. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Art of war. Um, but you know, like you could be there, they're not thinking it's you and you can hear what everyone says. I, I guess if you've got a really big name and a really big reputation. Um, I, I'll give you an example. Like Gary Vaynerchuk in America goes on and on and on about how he wants to buy one of the um, famous football team. teams. Yeah. I just think, well, you just put the price up because everyone knows yeah. you want to buy it. You're never going to get yeah. the cheapest. The price is going up and yeah. up and up and up and up. And there's sort of something I think quite good in being one of the people. Is it public? It's probably going to short it. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, it yeah, might buy another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah true. Um, yeah, but did you think that, what am I trying to say? I just find that dynamic interesting where you could actually get a bit of truth from the ground. Well, I quite like it. Yeah, you're right. So sometimes it's a pain in the ass because you just, it's another, you know, when you're trying to do stuff, you, you want it to be the path of least resistance. Yeah. It's another obstacle and a lot of nonsense you have to go through. Yeah. But it kind of dissipates very quickly. You're right that it is interesting that people don't expect mm. me to be me. Yeah. When I walk into rooms or I go to places, I think people are, and I'm quite an open, relaxed kind of guy. I don't turn up in a helicopter with a, you know, a driver and a security team. And they sort of think, <laughs> yeah. and they sort of think, oh, right, okay. And then they kind of relax, I think. So that's yeah. quite interesting. That's been quite helpful. And yeah. I've played that a few times where I've just sat there and said, okay, well, wait. Yeah, sitting there saying, God, Peter's such an arsehole, he's <laughs> <Yeah>. always late. <laughs> yeah. You know, I wish he'd do this or hasn't done that. And I'd be like, okay, well, I'm Piers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I've played oh, that, that game a few times. That would be so much fun. And then the other thing really, so one is about business, one about philanthropy. And I'm a big one in sort of, um, it's kind of philanthropic as well, about giving back, about business, I think, should be a force for good. So it's something I've always yeah. tried, I haven't quite cracked it yet, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I will do, is about having a, a business, quotes, might be a, not for profit, but a business, it's got a p and it's got a product, it's got a revenue stream, it's sustainable financially, that does good. And I think that no one's quite cracked that yet in terms of, you know, having businesses where the products or service people are willing to pay for, the margin, it makes it sustainable. I've been involved in so many charities where, you know, the, the funding tap stops, 
and they disappear overnight. Mm. So they're kind of, it's me, business making money. I think the other thing about businesses, I, I, used, to, I used to do things to make money, and I still do, but I made a decision the last, due to my midlife crisis, <laughs> to say, How like, you I'm 48. People right. think I'm like, probably younger, I hope. But <laughs> yeah. I'm 48, so I'm coming up to Big Five, so I'm due another crisis quite soon. <laughs> <laughs> the clock's ticking. Yes. So I've lost what I'm going to say now. I've got to have a sweat on them. <laughs> so the point Sorry, is about... Mate, we can edit that bit out. Yeah, the, that's that, all right. The point is about doing, is creating something which is um, a force for good. Yeah. And that's something I really, really want to do. Yeah. I, I think that's a, a business... You might need to edit that. I lost train of thought. That's all right. We, we, we do <clears> need yeah. it. So a business helping other businesses well, start up surely is a force for good. It's creating enterprise. Yes, I think, I think that... Um, Oh God, so I wrote a thesis at university, if you want to get really boring, <laughs> about the social contract and about the fact that, you know, organisations exist at the behest of society to do good. Mm. That's where allowance exist. Um, and if they're not, then they shouldn't exist. They should be regulated. So yeah. essentially, you know, business uh, historically was about the mill owner. It was about the mill owner and the, he would even use slaves to make money. Yeah. And now the, the concentric rings of interest, actually, have gone out to your employees, your stakeholders, your local community, the global environment. Yeah. So if businesses, um, if all of the, the private cost of, of creating a product or service are reflected in the, product, the cost of that, and you pay the fair price for it, then you end up with a, an economic model that makes sense. The issue yeah. is, is that the, the, the private cost in goods and services doesn't equal the public cost. Right. So the public cost is bottle tops turning up on the beach in Barbados where I was recently, which annoyed me on my favorite beach. Yeah. That's the public cost. And that's what we need to try and sort of get right, get that balance right. Right. And that's not easy to do. Yeah. Okay. So you said you're glazing thing. over there now. No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm just like, we're going to be here for a week. <laughs> yes, Otherwise, right. I haven't even got to question yeah. one yet. Um, no, I'm not glazing over. It's all interesting. Um, one more thing I want to pick up from what you said, and then we'll get into the pitching bit, because I'm fascinated by this, cause, and I have heard, heard a lot of different definitions, and I'd love us to have a bit of a debate on it. And that is the definition of an entrepreneur. Because you said small business owner and entrepreneur, not the same thing. So what did you mean by that? So there's often a confusion about you in business, you're an entrepreneur, you know, entrepreneurs and you rock stars, right? If you've got a corner shop. kind of are in a way, aren't they? Well, some are, yeah, some are. If you've got a, a corner shop or you're a freelancer or you've got a very small business and it makes 20, 30, 40 grand a year and the chance of it growing outside of that are pretty slim. You don't want to hire anybody else. You want it to be your thing. You know, are you an entrepreneur? So <clears throat> entrepreneur, if you look at the actual definition of it, really, is about taking risk. Well, so the dictionary th definition, someone who takes yeah. risk in the hope of profit. Yeah. So which I find ironic. But well, yeah. Well, I guess there's, there's, ri there's risk and the hope is another risk as well. Yeah. So the entrepreneur is somebody that may have a business, an existing business, and they look to grow that business. So that means you're going to take risk, as we all know. Um, I'll come back to my Dommel Vonsfeld analogy in a minute. But you take risk about the unknowns and the, what you do know. A startup is slightly different. So a startup, you're taking a lot more risk because you're, you're starting with hypothesis. So not, no company starts up to be a startup. You yeah. start up to create a sustainable financial model, a product or service that solves a problem people are willing to pay a price for, and you can deliver that product or service at a lower cost, which means you've got a profit. That's the, that's the way it goes. Mm. And what an entrepreneur does, a real startup entrepreneur, is test an hypothesis. And then not too long ago, it was about, right, I'm going to build this machine. I'm going to go to market. It, sink, it flies or it sinks. That was the end of it. Whereas now you look at a lean startup, that kind of iterative approach. Yeah. And that means you can manage the risk and reduce the risk by in the way in which you go to market and do that in a, in a sort of iterative way. Yeah. So that's, that's a new methodology. Well, it's not that new. People are just you know, some boffins at Harvard have called it a methodology, but a lot of entrepreneurs have worked that out a, lot, a long yeah. time ago. But <clears throat> there's that kind of approach to it as well. Now, you may have, you, know, you look at a lot of businesses, I know people in business where I've had a business for many, many years, and it's only now after probably seven, eight, even 10 years that they really start to grow because they built that foundation, they built mm. that base, and they're confident about it. And that's the difference. So I, I think people confuse the two. When they talk about SMEs, you know, SMEs, there's nine, what, 5.7 million businesses in the UK. 5.6 million of them are SMEs. That's under, I think, 250. 99.3% are sort of like sub-10 employees. So the vast majority of businesses in the UK SMEs are sub-10 employees. Wow. Even more than about 76, 76% I think, 
are one person. There's one owner manager. Or they have no employees. Yeah. They're talking about a huge proportion of business population as that. There's only about seven and a half thousand companies in the UK with over 250 employees. Wow. And they're big. Yeah. Then of course you've got the private, the public sector, sorry. Yeah. Which is huge as well. Mm. This is the private sector. So most of those business owners are business owners. Not entrepreneurs. No. There's a small so you think extra percentage. risk, scaling up, maybe multiple Then you've got scale up. So scale up, so you look at the scale up institute. The scale up institute does a lot of great research on what's a scale up. And they try and identify them using data. It's quite hard to do. So they're trying to use companies house data. I don't know if they get HMRC data or not. And they use that data about which companies are, there's an OECD definition about growing 20% on our employees or turnover a year for two or three years. There aren't that many scale-ups. There's a couple of thousand in the UK. So really? you look, Yeah, there's only about 35,000 mid-sized companies in the UK and a couple of thousand real scale-ups that fit the definition. Now, my view is a scale-up's a bit different, it's a bit wider. A scale-up is, if you're trying to use data, you've got to use, use definition where the data's available. We can't measure it. A scale-up to me is any business that has an ambition to grow. Yeah. And that can be you're doing 10 grand a year, I want to go to 50. 50, 500, 500, 5 million, 500, 50 million. Yeah. So they're entrepreneurs. Yeah. Now, what you have to remember is until reasonably recently, the onset of the technology sort of waves is that most entrepreneurs built a business from scratch over many years. Most venture capital or private equity, as is probably better known, went into management buyouts. These are people that never thought they were going to start a business. They were beavering away in their marketing company or making bricks, whatever it was. Yeah. And then they thought, actually, my boss is rubbish. I can do, I can do a better, <laughs> better deal on this. Or my boss or the family, they want to get out. Mm. So they went to 3i, one of the old funds back in the day, and raised some money and did a management buyout. Yeah. So most money went into established businesses yeah. that there was a growth opportunity. You know, they are entrepreneurs as well. Yeah. But you've got to, I think you've got to be quite careful with the sort of the nomenclature in terms of how you define people because yeah. a lot of people get lumped in the entrepreneur part. When you, they turn up at an event, they're like, all right, I'm going to grow your business. And he's like, no, I want to keep the lights on, keep my kids in school yeah. and pay my rent. Thanks very much. Yeah. And then so, why am I here? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's a different yeah, event. Yeah. Do you think entrepreneurship is also a mindset as well as a definition? Like being, having ideas, being creative, being maybe a little bit relentless, maybe that hole that you never fill, you push for more, having multiple businesses, you know, you sit on more than one board, you've got your finger in a few pies. Do you think that also is the spirit? There's the spirit of entrepreneurship? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, so there, there is a mindset. I think there's a lot of, a lot of crap on social media about, you know, the millionaire, billionaire mindset, you know. If you go if vegan, you can, I would say if you go vegan, run a marathon and do 200 press-ups a day, it doesn't mean, and read lots of these books, it doesn't mean you're going to be a billionaire. Yeah. So, you need to have the, the hypothesis, the growth plan. And I, I do about five steps of growth about having a plan, the people, the financing, and all that good stuff. But there's a mindset, you need to answer, you've got to, the ability to take on risk. Mm. Now, there are people that are born that way in many ways. They're just, I was, I was in a way, I started my first business when I was 13 years old, but that's just the way you're programmed. Yeah. There are people, going back to the, the kind of management buyout market, that learn be entrepreneurs, they never expected to be an entrepreneur. They just learned to do something very, very well and thought, hang on a minute, I can do this better than all the people I'm working for or competing against. So I'm going to do it myself, thank you very much. And they've created a huge amount of wealth. Leadership, which is part of that, you know, the, the military trains people to be leaders. You don't have to be born mm. a leader, an entrepreneur. You can learn these skills. You can put the people around you to make sure that you fill all those sort of skills gaps so you can become a more more rounded entrepreneur. So yeah. I think there is, you do need to have the, the mindset that you're willing to take risk and everything that comes with it. Because you, yeah. you know you've been in business, and you've had bad yeah. times and good times, so have I, is that yeah. there is the potential for your life to fall apart. Yeah. Um, and, and the sacrifices, there's cost. So if you're willing to accept that, I think that's a, you're a certain type of person. A lot of people are not willing to, and yeah. to be quite frank, uh, they shouldn't. I mean, a lot of people who, they like the idea of being an entrepreneur, when you dig into them, you talk about, well, this could happen and you realise this and it's a 10 year slog and it's six, seven days a week and you know, might not be able to go and do your skydive at a weekend if you want to do. Yeah. They kind of shy away from it. And mm. I said, well, it's probably not for you. And let's talk about that. Still haven't got to question one, but oh, right, that's okay. fine. Um, 
I've, I've, my mindset's changed a bit on the work. Um, and I'd like to be of a debate on this with you as well. So for a long time, people would say it takes 10 years to be an overnight success. But there's this kid called Ryan who's seven years old. He's got a YouTube channel that did $22 million <laughs> last year. Makes people buy me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, hate them, yeah. I've got like 500 followers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I know that that's a bit of a unicorn. But with social media, everything on um, internet, fiber optics, information traveling at the speed of light now, whereas it traveled a lot slower before, I do think you can get um, more successful more quickly than 10 years. Um, and people talk about. Is that, is that, I mean, if you leverage social media, if you put your, you know, you can reach more customers quicker yeah. than ever. I mean, people moan about social media, but you can reach millions of people that you don't even have to pay. Facebook is free, LinkedIn is free. Yeah. So, yes, of course, it depends on your product. You've got to have a good product and service. You can't be a personal brand if you haven't got a product or a service or a brand. Or, or a story, like young people, a story to tell. Yeah. That's really what they're selling. That's very true. Um, but people still talking about 10 years of slog and work and giving up weekends. Do you think you can work hard and smart? And do you think you could have a balanced life where you see your kids, you have some hobbies, and you build a sustainable business? Yes, you can. But there's no point in hiding away from the fact that there will be times where, when things are all going well, yeah, you can. Absolutely right. I've Ooh. done that for many years. Where you know, I get to go around my bike in the mountains, I get to see my children. You know, you, you, when things are going well, it's absolutely fine. When the wheels start to fall off yeah. and it's not going to plan, that's when the sacrifices begin to kick in. Mm. So I think it's different if you're a YouTube channel, but even on a YouTube channel, you know, they change the algorithm, yeah. people go off cupcakes, and suddenly you find that your people are interested. Yeah. And if your livelihood and your lifestyle now is revolving around the ad revenue from 22 million followers, and suddenly they, your watch time goes from 10 minutes down to 30 seconds, you've got a problem. Yeah. So the point I always say is, is that in the, I think the bigger point I think is that no matter what you do, I think in the not too long ago, you could sit back and rest on your laurels. You could sit back and say, that business is doing all right, I'll put some money into run it, and I'll go and sit on the beach. Which you can sort of do to some extent. Yeah. But I think now in dynamic markets, taste change, things change very quickly. You can wake up in the one morning and your whole market's changed, a new yeah. competitor, you're flipping your, your Gen X and our millennials and Gen Z, whatever it might be, something's changed, which means your business dynamics aren't the same. Yeah. So my view is, is that going back to your entrepreneur point is, if you, haven't got a, if you haven't got a growth plan, then at some point, very quickly these days, yeah. you're screwed. Yeah. It might have taken you five years to realise that, or ten years in the past. Now it can happen in a couple of months. Yeah. So I think that you can work smart, and you can, I think it's important to actually, I talk about, um, I, talk about I do a course where I talk about, let me say that. <laughs> so you talk about things like, um, I'll put the point actually. So I talk a lot about in my social media about, wellness so it's about your mental health yeah. in many ways your physical health yeah because you can't then, perform and then, and then you your business those. life as well so yeah. exactly if your mental health i don't mean like an actual illness just generally the way you think that mindset in a way isn't sort of healthy and if you're not looking after yourself and i, I do that sporadically i have times where i'm in the gym and i'm running and i'm riding bikes and I, i'm up here other times i'm like oh i can't bother yeah <laughs> it's yeah. very hard to get back into the former yeah there's that and if you haven't got those two sort of pillars really, that foundation, mm. I think it's very hard to perform. Yes. And hear this a lot on the internet as well, but I think it's true. If you haven't got those two aligned, yeah. you're hard to perform in business because your mind yeah. is often elsewhere. And I think in business, you made the point that you have to be creative. You've got to be looking for, you know, that, that. and again, if you look at the, the iterative, iterative approach now, yeah. it never ends. You never have a final product or service. Yeah. You are constantly now, you, you have say to. that in software, it's never finished. Well, any product now, yeah. no matter what you do, you're constantly now looking at your customer, feedback, iterating it. it never, you never get out yeah. of beta. You hear that a lot as well. And that, that's the case. So that's the fundamental difference, I think, is that you can manage it, but be prepared at some point to put the hours in. Yeah. And I think, I'm glad you said that. Because I think it's almost fashionable. You said before we put the cameras on, it's like, or it might have been when we were, in, when we were live about... Um, you know, entrepreneurs are new rock stars. But it's rock star to say, I work 17 hours a day, I don't sleep, I don't eat. It's very rock star oh, to say I mean, that. It takes 10 yeah. years to be an overnight success. I slog my guts out for decades. But actually, if you're a, a mum and you're 35 and you've got two kids, you don't want to hear that shit. You no. want to know what you can do. 
Uh, and I think that now with apps and technology, there's much more leverage. You can get a VA for not a huge amount of overhead. I mean, in the early days when we started business, you needed stock, right. premises, loans, the lot. You can do it very, um, you can be very agile now and keep overhead really low. When I first started, I had in mind, I had a garden flat and I had all, everyone in the front room, they used it as the office, there's no flipping. You could sort of get office space, like, you know, onto the small spaces these days, but it's very hard to do then. So it was in my front room. Big computers like that, I'm that old. And, <laughs> yeah. all, and I gave them my key to my part of my flat and they'd all turn up and work in the front room. They went, yeah. two ISDN lines. <laughs> You've never heard of that either. Yes. <laughs> it was like that. And the infrastructure was a night. We had you know dial-up, isn't we had a, we had a, we had a, too young to know what dial-up We had a bit is. of dial-up, we had yeah. servers, we had to take tape drives. You know, someone yeah. took a tape drive off-site, which yeah. was my, my flat. Yeah. And they're, they were in my front room and I was, I was in the back room. I had to get up in the morning and going there and work. I was still late for work quite often. <laughs> so now, <laughs> you're absolutely right. The beauty of it is, is that you can focus on the business of, of building a business. So it's about the product, the service, the customer. You don't have to worry about, you know, I've got friends that, they've had a product design in, well, tweaked in China. They deliver it to someone there, someone here. They check the, the order. That's then sent off to Amazon FBA. It sits in a warehouse. Yeah. They do everything for them. They literally do the marketing. Yeah. And when they run out, they have another app which talks to Alibaba or something, yeah. and they order more stock, it turns up, they never see the stock. All they're focused on is, right, that's my product, that's the customer, is it working? What's the ROI? What's my sales funnel look like? Why is it not working? Why is it getting stuck here? How do I fix that? Is it the product? Is it the market? That's all they're focused yeah, on. It's way more agile. Not the product. Yeah. Now, that's never probably going to be a massive business, it's got, it's got a, but lifestyle-wise, he can run that sitting on the beach or on the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't, yeah. doesn't matter. And that's the beauty of it. So you can, I think you've got to be realistic about how big these businesses can get. Yeah. I think a lot of people sort of say online, you know, you can become a billionaire doing Amazon, I'm not sure about that. Yeah. You know, you can probably have a nice lifestyle. You can maybe work how to do it once yeah. and have lots of products and replicate yeah. it, make a bit more money that way. Yeah. And then invest that in something else. Yeah. But there's no, the thing is, you can be entrepreneurs and you rock stars, but how many rock stars make it and how many last more than their first album? Yeah. <laughs> it's very, but it's you saying similar. that to me would just make me want to be one more. And but like, I don't really have the, I get that. But if you go and tell everyone, look, most people don't make it, you're kind of putting that's, that's out the fires of the ones that will make it. Well, I, I look at it like different. I sort of say, you can say that because what you're saying, and this is more startups now, not, not, not building established business. You can say that you have to understand, everybody has to understand there's a process. It's hypothesis, it's tested, it's iterated, and it will, it will work yeah. or it won't. If it doesn't work, move on to the next one. Yeah. So yeah, it didn't work. That's not a bad thing. That's the process. Yeah. Accept it, deal with it. Yeah. Investors know that, otherwise you shouldn't invest in, in those kind of companies. Move on to the next one. Mm. The most entrepreneurs I know made their money on three, the third, or fourth business. Right. Yeah, not many I know that have made, done very well for themselves. Yeah. It was a third, the business. That's, a, that's the only one you hear about there. Yeah. There's of lots, of, lots of other stuff yeah, that yeah. didn't work out. Yeah. So I think you've got to change the mindset around the process. Because somebody left their job, started a business, and it didn't work out, and they lost their shirt, and now they've got to go back and start again. They're not an idiot. No. They, they weren't wrong. They're not a fool. Yeah. They're actually brave. That's an entrepreneur. Yes. And they're the people who need supporting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm glad that you said that as well, because... I think if you look at statistics, you'd never get the heck out of bed. The statistics of startups failing and these failing business failing beyond three years and five years and 10 years. But actually, that's an average data set. What about someone who is entrepreneurial? What about someone who has got belief? What about someone who'll get up the second time, the third time, the fourth time? And when you get rid of all the data of people who, <clears throat> oh, they inherited a family business they never wanted, or someone who tried it, but they were never really serious and then went back into employment, and get rid of all of that, you've probably got a better chance if you look at it. And I'm the sort of person that wants to champion someone who tries things, takes a risk, you know, has got a bit of get up and go about them. Like if we said, oh, what percentage of people who went to martial arts school became black belt? It'd be a similar percentage. Mm -hmm. What percentage, percentage of people who got into videography became prof professional filmmakers? It'd be the same percentage. What percentage of people become Alexander McQueen or just a, another person who liked to, you know, design clothes but never made it? It'd be across everything, it'd be the same percentage. Yeah, people it, talk like in their industry, it's the only thing that's like that. Yeah. The thing is, well, you, it's very, when we have these conversations, people, they're, they're always, you're kind of lost and locked in the now. And you've got, to, you've got to fast forward. So, and again, this has been said a million times, but, you know, 
when I was a banker, we looked at the markets. I spent my life valuing companies, analyzing businesses. You could look at the revenues, know it's going to do 10%, 20%. You could extrapolate it and work out the card, the margin, the P&L, all this stuff. We're getting into a world now where it's going to be very, very different. There's a couple of things. So one is when software starts writing software, all bets are off. When software starts, all bets are, all bets are, are off. off. What, is, what do you mean AI. Look at AI machine learning there. Yeah. So once software can write software, the, it's going to become exponential, that change. Right now, humans have to write software, absorb things, test them, understand it. Yeah. AI and software, which way AI is, it can look at that in milliseconds and iterate something. Yeah. It can take several human generations to do in a few minutes. Yeah. So once we begin to crack that technology, the evolution of everything is going to change very, very quickly. How do you speed up? Speed up. It's going to become. So my point was earlier is that in when I was a banker, everything was linear. Now it's becoming exponential. exponential yeah. So once you put the AI into a robot, if you look at Boston Dynamics, these yeah. dogs and yeah, stuff, yeah. robots doing somersaults and yeah. God knows what. Once the AI starts to understand robots and start to design them, then that's going to change as well. Now the point is this: is that the future of work is going to be very, very different. So you hear a lot about um, robots Uber going drivers, to take our jobs. Uber drivers. Uber yeah. drivers, you've had it. A forklift truck driver, you've had yeah. it. An admin assistant, you've had it. Yeah, they're probably right. You just have to reskill. Well, accountants, they've had it. Computers add up quite well, actually. Lawyers. You're never going to, you're not going to get paid for doing a first draft of a sale and purchase agreement in the future because AI can do that for you. Yeah. You've all got to move up this value pyramid yeah. to the top. And what the machines can't do is, is, be, is be creative currently. So yeah. we, or emotional or, yeah, or emotional. So we have to, so, so you're most actually leadership. protected in the future yeah. if you're an artist yeah. or chef probably because yeah. it's super creative. So yeah. that's where the world's, the world's going and commerce as well. And the point I'm coming to is this, is that when you look at what you do in terms of a career, so there's lots of research, it's Dell, I think, that 85% of jobs in 30 years don't exist today. I think there's more research, which is in, in 10 years, half the jobs that kids in school will go into yeah. don't exist when today. When they say that, they don't tell you what the new jobs will well, be and all the that's new opportunities. Different, that's a different education podcast. <laughs> yeah. So we'll get into that another time maybe. But the point I'm making is, we're coming back to business now, yeah. is that... My point is this, is the gig economy is coming for all of us. So historically... You're all, just exciting me by all this stuff. Oh, right. well, well, it's, it's just loads of opportunity, opportunity, isn't it? Yeah. If you've got the right mindset. So yeah. historically, you know, my parents or parents, even me when I started out, you went to a big building, and still building them, we're around here, we're in King's Cross. You went to a big building, you worked nine to five, you went home. Organisations had employees. Now, the gig economy is coming for all of us. Is that organisations typically in the future, they don't want employees, you don't want employees. You want resource and talent available to deliver on certain projects for a certain amount of time. That might be a month, it might be five years, yeah. but we're all going to become, in a way, contractors, freelancers. Yeah. And the point there is, is that almost everybody, once it happens, is going to essentially be in business. You're going to be a personal brand. Yeah. You'd have to market yourself. You're going to have to realise, I can't do it myself. I'll club together a few other people because we can market ourselves better. That's a small, maybe loosely put together, that's an organisation. So increasingly, in the future, I, the point I'm getting to in a very laboured way, is that <laughs> everyone is going to be in business. Yeah. Exciting. I want that future now. And the, and the, and the other podcast we do another time yeah. is education, because right. they're not being prepped for that. Yeah. So you know, they've still got the three R's. You know, people are taught to read, write, and do arithmetic, because yeah. that's what you needed to work in a mill. Right, yeah. And the world has moved on and yeah. it's going to become exponential. And the point, the problem we've all got is if you're riding the wave, you'll go with it. If you're not, you get left behind. So the yeah. danger is, is that in business and society, is that that gap widens very, very quickly. Yeah. You have lots of trillionaires and then not much in the middle and people who have been disintermediated or disrupted by AI and robots. So there's a massive issue in terms of what we're all going to be doing, actually, yeah. for a job in a few years. That's a different... But the world's going to change, very, and it's very hard as a human, very hard, I think, as a human, to comprehend that. Yeah. If they crack, and AI is, that's why all these, that's why the countries are chasing this holy grail, because if you think about it, if you have exponential growth, and it starts here, if you're a day, if you're a day late, and it kicks off, you're always going to be a day late. Yeah. So that's how, that's why you have nation states chasing this. Now, right. huge opportunity for entrepreneurs. Yeah massive societal issue that 
we'll have to deal with one way or another yeah. somewhere down the line. I see, I sometimes think that there's always going to be societal challenge. And I have a mentor, he's called John Demartini, he's a very wise man. And he says that everything in society is exactly how it should be. And he has a very much a Buddhist, I suppose, outlook that, you know, there is no imperfection. We're perfectly imperfect, we're flawed. You know, there's always upsides and downsides to everything. There well, is, so so like we're striving for all this improvement and like society is doomed. But there's always going to be challenge. If there wasn't challenge, there wouldn't be growth. It's never going to be perfect. It's never going to be finished. It's never going to be a great order or hierarchy or even the opposite of that, which is where we're all level. Yeah, so we'll, we'll always, water will always find us level. Yeah. The point is, is that when, if, if we do go into this, this sort of a future of a exponential change, it's a question of well, what the hell does that look like? And yeah. sitting here today, none of us, no one, no. anyone doing their TED talk, they can't <laughs> pretend to understand yeah. what that's going to look like. Now, I disagree with your mentor slightly. The reason we have laws is because things aren't, things don't balance out. So the thing about law is, all law really does, especially in economics, is augment and manage the cost benefit. So for example, if there were no laws, if there were no employment laws, yeah. kids worked in factories, yeah. kids worked down mines, and that's what law does. So you tend to have... The humanity has created that well, in reaction have, to itself. Because it's human greed, yeah. basically. So society generally, manifestly, because we're humans, you end up with the winners and the losers. Yeah. And even in a small set of just employment law... But just, that, that creates the challenge that creates evolution. Well, and that's what law does. Yeah. So law, but the law is a human steps construct. in to try and fix it. Yeah. But laws always, this is the problem with law, laws always 10, 20, 50 years behind where society actually is. Right. It's got to catch up. Now, yeah. that's in the linear model. Yeah. Going to the exponential model, what the hell is the law going to do? Yeah. How's it going to, how's it going to keep up? Yeah. Well, entrepreneurs just need to get in early when there's less regulation and there's more money to be made. <laughs> that's one way of looking at it. The way of looking at it is, <laughs> is business should be a force for good. And I think yeah. that... I think the sustainable entrepreneurs, the ones that understand this, uh, there, will be, there will be trillionaires, we will have yeah. trillionaires in our lifetime. Um, the ones that understand this, this is what consumers now are looking for, that sustainability, that credibility, yeah. that provenance, that backstory. Yeah. They're the ones that are probably going to succeed. Well, I spoke to David McCall in this room a couple of weeks ago, I interviewed him, he's a billionaire, and he basically says that, look, the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest opportunities for entrepreneurs, climate change, plastics. You solve those problems, you're a billionaire. So, totally agree. But the problem is that you're going to have 15 trillionaires and 15 billion people that I can't afford to pay the rent. That's the issue. Now, I, I'm a, yeah, a, lot, I'm a, a free these, market yeah. capitalist, essentially. A lot of these billionaires and trillionaires end up making beer schools and libraries and giving yeah, back. No, and... But you can't rely on that. No, but society but a, usually a lot, a, lot of them, that. a lot of them buy yachts and fill them full of girls and stuff they shouldn't be doing. Yeah, so no, it just no, depends no, no, on who you are. And Bill Gates. And we'll He's a great example. No. Oh, and there's lots more like them. There's yeah. Tom Hunter. But there's many, many more that aren't like them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and and, the, and the, the living pledge is, is I, th I don't know the numbers actually, but I guess it's quite a first world thing. Mm. I'm not sure how many people from developing economies Thank have you. signed up to that. Yeah. Um, so the point is, is that you're absolutely right. Huge opportunities. But yeah. I think it's a question about doing that in a way which is um, responsible without yeah. sounding completely... No, I get it. I mean, I'm not, surely good business is doing good things and putting a business around it. Yeah. Well, and also doing, I think consumers, the issue with the internet is that the, the empowerment the internet provides to consumers is that you can't pull the wool over their eyes anymore. Yeah. I think I've seen the other day saying that, you know, in the old days, you could have a TV ad that told you there's some enormous cartoon bug in your toilet that's m wandering around that your neighbour might spot and you'll look like you'll be you'll be this sort of persona non grata in the neighbourhood. So you go and buy a load of cleaner. It's yeah. nonsense now. People can see yeah. through that. But the power of the internet is, well, the, well, the information is nonsense, is that they can research you, the product, yeah. the competition, but, and the that, price, that price matches. better it. products and services. So it should, yeah. that's, that's what it should do, yeah. yeah. And that's the opportunity for entrepreneurs, but also consumers are smarter. I don't think you can just be an asshole no. that's, that's trying to force something down somebody's throat these days yeah. that they don't really need with some clever advertising. Yeah, agree. Then that's going away. Yeah, yeah. You've actually got to add some value. Yeah. All right, should we um, do the pitching bit? Right, okay. And we've almost got two podcasts here, haven't we, if you think about it? Because now we've... To go I, to I, I can talk about endless shit all day long. Yeah. Oh, I could. Yeah, you, you said how long will this take? Yeah. All right then. So, um, obviously you're on Dragon's Den. Um, you've got big experience with... Um, investing in businesses, funds, etc. So what are the key elements of a really good pitch? 
So I think the important thing about a really good pitch is understanding where you are and who you're pitching to. So there is no point pitching a business like you know, for the IPO roadshow. It's going to be quite a different pitch to the one you give your mum to give you 500 quid to buy your first stock. Yeah. Very different pitches. Now, th there's, a, there's some similarities in there, but your pitch evolves over time. So if you go for those kind of concentric rings, so the first pitch is usually when you start in business are, is to your mum, your dad, your mates, your family. Yeah. And they might say, I've got friends actually who put money into my businesses that drag me around to their office and grill me for two hours, yeah. which is fine because they they get it. Yeah. A lot of people have said, oh, I, I, well, yeah, I like your peers. I've sent the money already. Yeah. I, was, I was in the toilet, I sent you the money. <laughs> you can go now. <laughs> and I'm kind of like, yeah. right, okay. Now, what well, is this thing you have with people sitting on the toilet? <laughs> so, that's why yeah, I can't believe that. I keep, <laughs> I don't know why I keep thinking about me, we'll go to the toilet. Yeah. So, the, so when you start with your family and friends, it's a made different pitch. They're investing in you. They're, they believe in you. Yeah. It might not work out, but they believe you'll give it your best shot because they know you. Yeah. Now, as you begin to move away from people that know you, so it might be your friends of friends, then they're going to start to ask more questions. So then you get into the pitch, I think. I think beyond that, it's not really it's about you. Now, first of all, they're going to want to believe in you. The first thing they need pitch is about humans, pitching to humans. So the minute you walk in the room and you make eye contact, you shake someone's hand, that, that's when it actually starts. So it's that human connection. Now, you can go through all the things you need to put into a pitch in the business plan. So it can be you know, the team, it can be the market opportunity, it can be your go-to-market strategy, the product, the service, you know, the marketing, the, your, your first campaign, your use of funds, your financial model, you can Google all of that stuff. It's quite patently obvious. But I think in a, in a young business, especially someone was in Dragon's Den, for example, when they walk out of that lift, they look at you, you are looking at them. Mm. And that's the key thing, I think. All the rest of it, you can go and tick, you you can for, go and tick the boxes. Look at that person. I'm, I'm and I am going to invest in this person. Now, I, I get the business plan, I understand it, and it, makes, it holds water, yeah. otherwise I'm not going to invest in them. But what is it about this person, I believe, that they're going to execute that? Have they got the right skill set? Yeah. And often people I find in pitches, they have got the right skill set or the right experience, but they haven't communicated that particularly well. Right. So they kind of miss something. So you've got to walk in there, tick the box in terms of, yes, I have the skills, the capability, the understanding to execute on this business plan. If I haven't, I accept and I understand that. And I put a team around me that fills in the gaps because yeah. none of us are perfect in terms yeah. of our skill sets. So your team, your people is fundamental. I think, and that's what everyone misses, and I think it's, it's the people. Yeah. The rest of it is kind of box ticking. Your yeah. business plan will hold water or work. Now, what people also forget, obviously, is, is about the, the kind of the go-to-market strategy. So people often say, I've got a business, I've got a product, and I'm going to do some marketing, and they kind of miss out in the middle about, well, as you point, said earlier, there's lots of different ways now you can go to market. People tick, they tick all the same boxes. It's about, well, I'm going to go direct or indirect or channel, or I'm going to use Amazon fulfillment, whatever it might be. You've got to be more creative. People are looking for creativity, and you've got to go out there and do your research. I think most pitches, when you look at them, you can tell very quickly is, have they done the homework? Yeah. And I think as an entrepreneur, you have your, going back to Donald Rumsfeld, your known knowns. So they should know that. It should be very clear. They understand the basics. They spent 20 years in that market. They know it. There's a known unknowns. So they are the, the stuff, their business is actually, they're the, the, the risks they're taking in a way, but kind of the, the, the business plan essentially. They've shown you that they've done the homework, they understand what it is they're going to need to go and work out. Then there's the unknown unknowns. That's what makes you an entrepreneur. Right. So <laughs> they're the things out. that you don't even know that yeah. you don't know yet. Yeah. But very quickly, is this person going to get their head around that? And as they, yeah. begin, to, as they begin the march of this business, the unknown unknowns will become some of them right. unknown knowns yeah. or known unknowns. Yeah. So then you have to go and work them out. Yeah. Can I just say something about that? Because it always gets missed by everyone. Sorry to jump in. And like, for me, that's the most exciting thing about business. What I don't yet know that's going to happen in the future that is going to take me by surprise and be amazing. So in like, your pitch, that's great. But in your pitch, it's quite hard to, quite hard to say to people, right, what I don't know is yeah. I don't, you know, that. But yeah. you've got to get in your pitch across that. I know what I know. But you could show proof of things that were that in the past, could you? You could do, but, I mean, but they're, your, they're, your known, they're your known unknowns. But they're the previously unknown unknowns. 
Yeah, yeah, potentially. Yeah. So yeah, the the, 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 fu- the past, obviously. Yeah. So it's all about the future. So getting back to the pitch, it's yeah, about sorry. the people. Yeah. It's about showing the person that you're trying to, <laughs> to get money off. Yeah. That's your business. That you've done your homework and you actually know what you're talking about. Right. And that you explain the hypothesis. Yeah. You know what is it? Very simply, what is the hypothesis? Now you see these presentations going around the internet about the first. I don't know. Airbnb, I don't know if it was, but someone's made it up and called it that. Yeah. But this is, you've got to say, make it very, very simple. What is it you're trying to do? Yeah. What is it you're trying to do? Why does the world need you and your product? Yeah. Who is your customer? Right. And how the hell are you going to connect the two? Yeah. And when you connect the two, can you do it in a way that makes money? Right. That's your business plan. Yeah. And then once you've done that, can you then show you can create a sustainable financial model that you can repeat it and scale it up? Yeah. People get lost in all the detail. Yeah. That's essentially it. It's proving your hypothesis. Now, if you're raising your money, if you're pitching for business that's established, which is growing, very, very similar, but what you have to show is how, in a way, how do you de-risk that with the, the, to the mothership without blowing it up? Right. Because often they're the cash flows that the investors are looking at. I think actually that de-risks the growth because the growth doesn't happen I've still got that. So yeah. don't throw all your eggs into the growth basket. Make sure that your pitch explains that the mothership, those established cash flows, are protect to some extent. We understand that you can't just suck all the juice out of that business because yeah. that enhances the risk. Okay, cool. It seems to me when you watch Dragon's Den and... Uh, so that sounds quite complicated with Dragon's Den, but that's... Yeah, no, no, that's yeah. great. That's what I wanted some detail, so that was really nice. Um, I've been to some angel investing events we talked earlier, I've, I've not raised money for my businesses through choice at the moment. I would never say never. But it does seem to me the commonality is no matter how good the business, business model is or the product, if they don't like the person, they're usually out. And you can have not the perfect pitch, like Levi Roots is probably the best example. And if they really like the person, they'll often go in. That's what it seems like from the outside. Is that the case for you? Yeah, so a good one. I invested in um, Lost My Name, which is wonderfully, which is probably... I don't, know, I don't know the numbers exactly, but, you know, Levi Roos, but this is now doing tens of millions, Google invested in it. Yeah. It's uh, quite a big business now. And they, these, these guys walked out and there were, um, I guess, four Israeli, I think the PhDs, half of them, walked out and they gave a great pitch, very simple. You know, we want to make, you know, bedtimes beautiful and create stories for children that are personalised. Quite obvious thing, quite simple. They've already had a, an investment fund interested. He's done due diligence, they've got a term sheet. So I could see that actually a lot of the, the due diligence, obviously, that fund's done. Mm. Let's focus on these guys. And their pitch was very clean, very simple, and they could have done it probably, they probably did it in five minutes. Yeah. And when I got it, and I was, yeah. kind of, I was kind of in. People would walk come out in Dragon's Den, talk. Don't forget Dragon's Den, you see 12 minutes. Yeah. So they come out, they pitch, and then we all ask questions. And if it's interesting, they could be there for two hours, right. probably an hour, two max, yeah. but at least 40, 45 minutes. You see maybe 12 minutes, sometimes five minutes, yeah. even three minutes sometimes. So they would come out, talk, doing their pitch, do a presentation, and the first question would be from all the dragons, so what is it you actually do? <laughs> and that's a sign of a bad pitch. Yeah, Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. they get lost in the detail. It's like, right. what does it do? Why does the world need your product? Yeah. Well, who are you? Do I like you? Can I work with you? Do I want to give you money? Yeah. Why does the world need your product? Who's your customer? Why are they going to buy it? And what are, they, what are the basic mathematics and dynamics of that product? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's big, I think, what you said. Why do I want to give yeah, you why? money? There's the five whys, seven whys. Ask yourself, why, why, why? Yeah. And if you keep asking yourself, why, probably as entrepreneurs, you get, I've done it myself, you get um, entrepreneurial, opti- op- you get op- sort of blinkered optimism. Yeah. So you think, right, I am going to sell this product. It's amazing. And people want yes. it. And you yeah. go and test and they go, no, nah, I don't actually. Yeah. Why would I buy that? No, I've already got something that does that. Well, no, but, oh, this is going to do it in such a... And you get lost in the fact yes. and you get obsessed with it. Too much passion in the product. And I kind of say, look, you've got to approach it almost. This can be really hard to do when you're passionate about something like a scientist. It is a hypothesis. Yeah. Test it. Does it work? Yeah. If it doesn't work, I've said in quite a few things on social media, don't chase rabbits down holes. Yeah. I've done it. Yeah. You get obsessed with something. You know it's not really quite right. You know it's not really a market. It's going down. The wheels are falling off. And you chase it down a hole. You've got to have, and I, as you get older, you kind of become more objective. You've got to be able to say, nah, fill the hole in, move on to the next one. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, 
What's the best pitch and what's the worst pitch you've ever seen? You must remember both of those. Yeah. On Dragon's Den or generally? Yeah, on Dragon's Den. Just so on Dragon's, so Dragon's Den, the best pitch, I think, was the, the one that we lost my name pitch because it was just clean, simple. They, they thought about it. They'd obviously had some sort of schooling and they knew how to pitch something. It was yeah. very simple. What's the proposition? What's the hypothesis? What are we going to do? How are we going to make money? Boom. Done. Yeah. I'm in. Yeah. Um, and, and you just and, knew straight away. And, and I knew they could throw in a bit about, there's a VC fund that's done a bit of due diligence. That gives you a bit of a sort of a risk cap. You think, okay, well, yeah. I don't need to get too much work there. Then there's the other extreme. This is a chap called, uh, he had a company called Barthematic. He walks in and goes, right, what I've got is an amazing product. It's a load of computers and valves and systems. And he gave me this, um, this device that he's created, which is a control mechanism, which basically was a bit of perspex with some buttons glued onto it. It wasn't, there was no even electronics in it. It didn't even turn. It's glued some buttons on a, on a tile. I go, right, okay, well, that's, that's a mock-up. He's going, oh, no, that's, that's the MVP. I was like, no, <laughs> that's a mock-up. Well, what does it do? What it does is it fills your bath up to a level that you want to have your bath at. And if you want some oil or some scents, it'll drop a few drops in your bath. And I'm like, right, okay, so how much is that going to cost? About 15 grand or something stupid. I said, right, well, what do you want? I want 2 million quid. I can't remember the numbers exactly. Is that 2 million quid for like 10% or something? And I go, right, and what the hell are you going to do with 2 million quid? Well, not only for the product, what we really need is a marketing suite in the shard. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, I look at the producers like, is this like, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's taking a mick here. Yeah. And they're like, no, 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 no we're, we're out. But what's interesting, and you've probably seen this, is that you know, there's lots of stories of entrepreneurs as the there's the, uh, the biotech company recently that invested, raised billions and went, was basically a scam. Yeah. That if you've got somebody who's got the ability to pitch well, get people to believe in them, a lot of people raise quite a lot of money for nonsense. Well, that, I was just going to say, they could, the <laughs> or, best thing... Or even frauds. The best thing they could be good, good at is the pitching itself. Because hmm. I've, for example, um, I'm sure you've done lots of interviews in the past and we've got quite a lot of staff. And sometimes I look at people and I go, you're just bloody good at being interviewed, but probably not that good yeah, at doing the job. not looking at me. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so, so, so you must see these people who are great pitch artists, but maybe not so good at the business I mean, behind it. How do, you, well, how do you work that out? I work in tech quite a lot. So you see a lot of people that are super intelligent, got great ideas, they understand the technology, maybe not perhaps the market, but they've come up with something which you, know, you can see the potential for, but they're incapable of communicating oh, that's, that's that. That's a question I wanted to ask. Yeah. Capable of communicating that. Because you've got to person. see beyond that. You've yeah. got to see someone who's a great pitcher, but are they just a great pitcher? Someone who's got a great idea, but they're terrible at pitching it. Because yeah. I, I interviewed Theo Pafitas a yeah, few yeah. weeks back for, for my podcast, and he went at me on this. I told him that I was getting into like a drones business, and he went at me. He went, question, 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 yeah. question. I just panicked. I mean, it's my I'm just doing a podcast. Yeah. And, like, and I could imagine, and I sort of almost saw myself in the den. And a lot of people watched that and went, geez, Robbie went for you. He was probably just trying to get to the, the nub of it. But I sort of, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, even though I did know. Yeah. So, sorry to sort of yeah, jump yeah. on what you're saying. But basically, <clears throat> yeah, how do you work out, okay, they're a good picture, but maybe the business is not good behind it. I actually think that's a good product and I like them, even though their pitch was shit. You've got to go through all that minefield, haven't you? Well, often in, I've done tech uh, out of universities and, you know, and with sort of PhDs really, and you can see the potential in the product, but you've got to build a team around them. Yeah. Because quite often, there's, there's a few examples, um, some like Lynch, you know, he was, he's a very technical chap. Yeah. He bought quite a big business, clearly. Um, but often, you've got to look at that person and say, I might not even like you actually in some cases, you're just an absolute genius, and you created, you know, the Google algorithm. Yeah. So that's good self I've got to create something around you. Most people around would you. not be able to put money into something to someone they didn't really like. I think that is really good self-awareness to be able to make a decision based on doing something with someone you don't necessarily like. But the problem you've got is getting them to understand that. So they've got an idea, I want to build a business. You're saying, I get it, you're not the right person to run the business. Right, you might yeah. be the right person to go and talk at a technical conference, but you, you're not a people person. Because right. often in tech companies, you've got to try and get very good people to leave their jobs and join your business. You've yeah. got to be a leader. You've got to have some personality, a bit of charisma. Right. And if they haven't got that, 
Sometimes it's quite hard to tell somebody that. Yeah. I get some more as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I see a lot of people, just generally, oh, I never do any, any business with anyone I don't like, oh, I don't like this, I don't like that, they look at them, they don't like the way they look, they don't like the way they dress. And I think, actually, maybe you should be a bit more open-minded at that and forget whether you like them or don't like them because that's your own prejudgments and just figure out what they're good at and what they're not good at. So again, going back to pitching and business, so it depends where you are in the life cycle of a business. So if you're a startup, literally you're going to be sat in a room together, literally in a bedroom almost, or your kitchen table, you've got to be able to get on and work together. Yeah. If you're buying out a utility company with 100 years of cash flows and you can understand the regulatory framework and the demand schedule, where it's going to go, it doesn't really matter if the whole management team disappears in a puff of smoke the right. day after you close your investment deal. Because you're not you're looking at the fundamentals of the business, clearly the CEOs makes a difference, but it doesn't make as much of a difference as if in your tiny startup, your management team all decide one day to go and join a kibbutz. Yeah. So you've got a problem. And there's everything in the middle of those two. Or go and sit on the toilet. Or go and sit on the yeah. toilet, yeah. <laughs> exactly, or lock myself in the bog. So, <laughs> and, there's, and there's everything between those two in terms of your management team is, do you need to get on with them? Yeah. Do they need to, are they fully rounded? You need to um, build on that team with different skill sets and yeah. put people in. You know, you see investment funds often put in um, non-execs or chairs that understand the industry. Mm. So it's partly governance, it's partly expertise, partly mentoring, but yeah. the institutions kind of do that in an institutional way. Yeah. Okay. What are the commonalities of the worst pitches you've seen? Like if you could say the top three things that you see all the time that you just <clears throat> shudder at. So what one is they haven't done the homework. Right. So they pitch something to you so that you're not, you're not interested in. So right, someone pitch, people pitch me all the time and say, right, what I've got is, I don't come from a random idea. Um, the property is a good example. I don't really do property. Probably I should. Talk about it later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I won't pitch I'm sure you, you can help yeah. me. But, you know, it'd be something that I'm just not interested in. Wind farms. Yeah. Good one. Um, it's like if you do your homework, you can work out, broadly speaking, mm. what I'm interested in. There's no point handing me on social media or email to try yeah. and get me to do something that I've just got no interest in or expertise in whatsoever. Yeah. So often people haven't done their homework. Mm -hmm. And the worst case is always when they, people, I don't care if someone's nervous. I don't, like in the day, it's TV, right? You don't care if someone's nervous. You don't I guess care, you can see through that. You, you don't care if someone doesn't really know the numbers particularly well, because you, yeah. you can go around that and follow up later and do due yeah. diligence. You can't on TV because they're standing in front of you. You don't really care about that stuff. But if they pitch to you, and you do not understand the core proposition of why, what's the product, who's the customer, why they're going to buy it, for example, or who they are, and it hasn't been communicated, that's a terrible pitch. Yeah. And that's very, very hard to come back from. Yeah. Do you see on the Dragon's Den a few times, you know, the clashes, the personalities that get a bit argumentative or whatever. Is that just sort of TV fluffery or does that happen quite a lot? No, the so Dragon's Den is quite interesting. So I, I think Dragon's Den is the business, as you know, it's hard to make, make televisual. Yeah. So Dragon's Den, I, I still believe, is it's the best representation of business on TV, although it's very much early stage startups and angel investment. Yeah. Because you know, what would happen on Dragon's Den is somebody would be on TV and they maybe start crying or we'd catch them out on their P&L or didn't understand what their gross profit margin was. And then we say, oh, we're out. So everyone goes, well, the Dragon's didn't invest because you know, Brian or Melanie didn't understand his numbers. And you'd be like, well, no, we didn't invest because they're actually asking us to invest using a convertible instrument in a subsidiary of a Canadian um, licensing or royalty-based business or franchise. Yeah. Now, that is not TV. You just switch off and go, of course, and, watch, yeah. go and watch Gogglebox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you just switch off. It's too, yeah. too boring, too complicated, too legal. Yeah. You wouldn't understand that. So what they have to do on Dragon's Den is find within, you know, sort of almost sort of the journalistic credibility in a way, yeah. is find a storyline that kind of works and they follow that storyline. Mm. So it's real, there's no prepping, you don't know who they are. When I was on Dragon's Den, literally I turned up there, it was like, hello, hello, hello. Sit in a chair, bit of makeup, yeah. because I needed it. <laughs> bit of makeup, boom, they come out, that's right. it, yeah. off you go. Yeah, That was it, so yeah. that's real and I think that I still think that, and I'm working on this myself actually, we'll talk about it separately, it's about it needs to be moved to social media, though. It needs to? Move to social media. There's got to be a way of, because of the nature and the power of the internet and democratising this stuff, there's got to be a way of creating a slightly different format, if that's the right word, of <clears throat> that experience yeah. and bringing it together right. and doing it, doing it online. Why did you um, 
have two years. I was going to say only have two years, but that might not be the right word. But why did you have two years and not one or 10? You know, why did you do the stint that you did and why did you end up not carrying on? So a couple of things. So one is, it's quite time consuming. There's lots of reasons for it. So one is it's quite time consuming. Like how much? And, um, well, well, it was probably six, seven weeks just filming it. And you got the PR. Oh, back to back to back to back. All the other, no, so you did about two weeks. Um, probably saw seven, eight pitches a day. So you probably see a, a hundred and twenty odd per program. Wow, quite a lot. So yeah. you're sitting there, you know, eight a day for two yeah. weeks, and maybe two two week stints, or whatever. Yeah. So I think the time commitment was an issue because I, I wasn't. I was never. I wasn't. I wasn't somebody that made a lot of money and could do what the hell they wanted. Really, I was more. I've got a board of directors saying, "Well, where the hell are you?" Yeah. <laughs> so I had yeah. that issue as well. And at the time, I had a company which um, wasn't the share price was doing particularly well. So Dragons Den were looking at that, I think, and thinking, "Oh, hang on a minute." Is he gonna, <laughs> what's gonna happen here? Because I was yeah. still the entrepreneur. I wasn't yeah. sort of sitting on my, in the back of my Maybach. And then um, I think Kelly, Kelly left and Duncan left as well. And then they, were, they were kind of toying with the format as well about you know, how many dragons do we have? And it all just fell apart really. Yeah. And I sort of thought, well, no, I, I never wanted to be, I never wanted to be Piers Linney the dragon. I wanted to be someone who's, who did it. Right. So really, it so came you've been to, on it, but you didn't want it to. Yeah, and it like came, came to, you've been on the apprentice that almost defines you. You didn't want it to define. Yeah, you. and it came to the point really where it just didn't work, and that was the end of that. Yeah, and actually, that was a good thing. Yeah. Also, I'd done two years. Probably invested probably half a million quid. Right. Um, and I had I had other things I needed to do. Yeah. Things of the time. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And um, the guys that were on the show with you, um. Who did you get on with the best and the worst, and who put the big amount? Of, I didn't want to ask too much about that, but it's just quite similar. People actually. want it. It's quite interesting. People who they always say on, on their social media, "Oh, so and so never invested this much." And actually, when you look at it, apart from some big deals, um, it's, it's it kind of averages out in terms yeah. of who invests, how much, and how many deals. So when I was in Dragon's Den, I did two deals on my own, which I think the biggest in each series were hundred grand. Yeah. Um, you know, you get EAS, SCIS. You know, it's the same as investing as an angel, basically. Yeah. So. Yeah, everyone was quite similar, really, averaged out quite the same way. It just depends on which one you watch, whether you like somebody, whether you remember they invested. Yeah. But I think what's interesting in the US, they invest millions. Yeah. That's the interesting thing. Dragon's Den was always a bit, you know, what, 20 to 100, 200 grand maybe. Yeah. In quite an early stage business. Whereas in the US, is quite a different ball game. They'll, yeah. they'll throw big money after, you know, ventures that are sometimes like a bit, a bit further down the road. Mm hmm so there's the Shark Tank format is a little bit different to Dragon's Den. Yeah. Okay, cool. So if you're starting out, would you raise capital or not? So my advice is don't raise money unless you have to. Second point is even if you need to raise money, don't raise it until you absolutely have squeezed as much value you've got as far as you possibly can before you do. Caveat to that. If you know you're going to have to do that, so if you know, let's just use some numbers, if you know you've got 12 months run rate with your life savings, and this is, they're talking about a business that needs, you, know, you can build a business from scratch, yeah. slowly, it doesn't need any money. Yeah. But if, you need, if you're building a tech company, obviously, sometimes the, the upfront investment... Yeah, a really complicated yeah, product. It's more yeah. than your, your personal um, um, capability to fund it. So you're looking at 12 months out, you know you've got 12 months. Don't start trying to raise money in month 11. Yeah. You've got to start thinking about raising money, probably even month four or five, actually, right. if you're ready for it. And you want to start talking to people in month six. Yeah. You want to be closing it in month 10, 11, latest, because right. the danger is, is that if you run out of road, no matter how good your business is, and I've been there as well, yeah. we're quite big numbers. If you run out of road, you end up, you know, you haven't got a business or you end up selling it in a fire sale, which I like to do. Yeah. So don't raise money. Now, the reason I say that is because when you raise external finance, no matter how much or how little, you lose, you lose some control of your business and, and your destiny. Now, that can be a good thing because you get the capital and you get expertise, access to markets and networks and all that good stuff. But you've got to understand and read the small print. I've seen businesses, this is both as, a, as professionally, um, as an investor and as someone investing in me, you read the small print. So extreme examples are... Someone gives you a shareholder agreement and it says in there they can veto any further equity or debt. So if you ever need a penny more, they've got you by the whatever you've got, the mm. short and curly essentially, they've got you. So it's little things like that or debt instruments. Understand what triggers default, what happens on default. How can you rectify default? Uh, understand your, 
um, your covenants. Make sure you absolutely own property. You understand that. Understand your covenants. Understand what it is yeah. I'm signing. You can raise. So I, I'll give you an example. I meet entrepreneurs who say, Piers, I've just raised 500 grand for my startup at a 10 million valuation. I'm kind of like, wow, how do you manage that? Oh, you know, the fundamentals of business. I'm like, okay. So what's the deal? Well, they get three times the money back. Uh, they've got swamp rights. And if they don't hit our EBIT, oh, this is a new business. They don't hit our EBITDA target in year three, which is like, you know, trying to put a straw, find a needle in a haystack. They don't do that. They have swamp rights. They have um, anti-dilution rights. They have the right to put somebody on the board. Basically, you lose your business. Mm. So, yes, you raise money. The, the headline valuation may look like you're a genius, you know, yeah. but actually, you've just given your business away. Yeah. And I, I know that now, today. Yeah. I, and that was way three years. I can tell them that today. Yeah. And they're kind of like, oh, really? I'm like, yeah, yeah. you need to go and sort it out. Like, See, you know, um, you've got this online course you created, is that right? Is it on Teachable? I don't know, startup.peerslily.com. Right. So I made, a, I made a course trying to answer a lot of these questions. That, I was just going to say, all those things in a contract that people can tie you up around, that would be good information for people to find out. Yeah, so what happened to me is um, I was, I kind of was looking at social media and I thought, you know, a lot of people ask questions that I think that the answers to me are quite obvious because I've, I've been there and done it, I suppose, and I know people that can help me or support I can reach out to. And the entrepreneurs ask these questions again and again and again. I thought, there's got to be someone on the internet that can go and find these answers. So I started yeah. looking. A lot of it's kind of motivational, you know, millionaire mindset, yeah. whatever, yeah. which is fine. We want a bit of that. It's nice. Yeah. But actually, what I've been more focused on is execution, practical advice. You know, mm. Do you understand what you need to be thinking about when you start a company in terms of research? Do you understand what you know, VAT is? Do you understand capital gains tax? Do you understand marketing, sales, how important sales is? Mm. You understand um, cybersecurity, how you build a customer service, just the basic stuff that most people, no matter what your business is, need to understand. And it's kind of like people often ask me, Chris, can I have a coffee? But if I forgot to pay the tenner for every coffee I get, <laughs> yeah. I would be a billionaire. <laughs> I can tell you that now. So I said, look, I can't do a coffee with you, yeah. but you can buy this course or module from yeah. the tenner, and that will answer the question. Yeah, you've got to pay for it, but I put like nine months' work into it. Yeah. So, and, and it's, you know, it's a lot cheaper than it should be. So there you go, off you go. And that, that's worked quite well. Yeah. And a lot of the answers are in there. And if it sort of gets real traction, I'll keep adding to it as well. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, I, I, when I get a load of common questions about something, I tend to just write a book on it and then get them to go by. So, the in a book. way, my course Similar. is my book. Yeah. I couldn't bother writing a book. I get someone to ghostwrite it. So, in a way, I sort of sat in a studio, yeah. wrote it out, and kind of it's my book in a way. Yeah. Um, that's how I see it. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, so we'll start speeding these up a bit quick fire. I'll tell you what I'd like to do. Um, it'd be cool to do a couple of personal questions, just like, you know, not too personal, but uh, maybe we could add that for a format in the future. Yeah. I've got, a couple of, I've got a couple of questions I'd like to ask Piers. Okay, fine. Um, how would you raise capital the quickest? From people you know. Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. And that depends on whether you know people that can provide the amount of capital you need. If you yeah. can't, if you don't, then you have to go elsewhere. But it's people who are going to invest in you as much as your business, yeah. which works fine if it's small beans. And a lot of people, they say things like, oh, I never go into business with your family, and you know, I never borrow money from your family or your friends. What do you think on that? Well, I've done both. Um, you've got to think about that very long and hard. Yeah. I, I've lent money to friends, hasn't worked out. And friends have lent me money, I haven't been able to pay them back when I was supposed to do. You know, be lost be friendships be over... Not yet. No. <laughs> but I, I've, I've had friends that invested in businesses yeah. and lost money and you have to go around. And luckily, a lot of my friends, they understand that they can see that they got the idea, they can see that we worked our absolute yeah. socks off, they want to call it, to make it work, and it might not have done. Yeah. So they kind of get it. Right. But some people who invest in you, so the, the point about taking money off people, you've got to make sure they can, it's money they can afford to lose. Because yeah. what you don't want to do is, Risk, yeah. yeah, that's the thing. And then the difference with family is a bit different, is that with family, you can commit to paying them back over your lifetime. Yeah. When it's a professional investment, the investment relationship is dictated by whatever that agreement is. Yeah. So you either pay them back when you're supposed to, or you don't, mm. and there's a legal solution, or there isn't. Yeah. With your mum and dad, you can say, it might take me 20 years, <laughs> and I'll sell a liver, but I'll, I'll pay you back. <laughs> and that's a bit different. Yeah, it sounds like you've said that before. Yeah, it's yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. been there, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. 
Um, if people get turned down for raising money, you know, once, twice, five times, should they just keep hustling and keep going or should they maybe think that it's... No, so raising money um, and, you know, you're in sales as well, so it's selling. People forget that as well. So pitching, it's raising money, it's a sales process. Mm. So you've got to have, right, your product is your business. You've got your marketing strategy, how you're going to get it out of there, your sales strategy, and it's a funnel. So you're basically saying, right, I've got a funnel of opportunities here, prospects. I'm going to, I'm going to go through the, bring them down the funnel. I'm going to talk to them, see if they're relevant. Um, and then hopefully some of those convert into investors in my business. Now, if for some reason your funnel, there's a, the, you, can't, you can't qualify them, there's a blockage, you've got to ask yourself, well, why is that? Is, there, is your funnel too small? Is the fact that your product's wrong? Is your pitch wrong? Is Don't say, wrong kind of so do not pitch, just write a pitch deck or a business plan, send it out, um, have negative feedback or no feedback, and just keep sending out yeah. the same thing. It's the same iterate like a product. You've got to say, get feedback. I know you didn't invest. Why not? Yeah. Well, right, okay. Go away, look at it. So we'll kind of fix that. Did they miss something? Or yeah. can I clarify that point? and change your presentation mm -hmm. and iterate it constantly. Mm -hmm. your, if your pitch deck that you start with is exactly the same one that you end up with, then you're a genius. But I've never seen that. Yeah. You should be iterating it. Okay, thank you. Um, you talk about friends, family, etc. but are there other places people can go if they're looking for investment? I mean, you know, Angels Den, <clears throat> London Business Angels, you know, various people. Are there places people can go? So um, I'm a non-exec director of British Business Bank, right? And one of the, the research shows, really interesting stuff, is that over 70%, just over 70% of entrepreneurs would rather forego growth than raise money. Which is what I think is an interesting stat. And a lot of that is because they just don't understand the process or the source of capital. So when you want to raise money, people often, they go and talk to friends and family, it's those concentric rings. Friends and family, friends of friends, or... Oh, they want to go and knock on doors of people I don't know. They want to go to an angel fund. They want to crowdfund. So the point, do I want to go and raise debt? Because I've got a, maybe I've got an established business. I want to grow it. I can go and raise some debt. There's, um, you can now actually factor your revenues now, your credit card receipts. There's peer-to-peer -peer lending. The point is there are a growing number of ways in which you can raise money for your business. And quite often, most people, um, I've got a background in corporate finance, so I tend to know this stuff, and I sit on the board of the government bank. But most people do not understand their options. And the key thing is, is to go out and understand your financing options yeah. and then pick the ones, might be more than one, that are most relevant, that you're most likely to be able to close down and then you go after those. Yeah. You know, people just don't understand the options, especially yeah. when it comes down to you know, debt instruments and cash flow financing, asset financing, uh, financing using your credit card receipts, crowdfunding. Mm. Now, none of it's easy. You may get knocked back again, but the options are huge. Yeah. And technology is changing them every day. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, you have an initiative called Hashtag Scale Up. What's I've that? got two now. I've got a startup and scale up. Ah, so, so tell us about those. So, so well, when I looked at the market about a couple of years ago, and I thought about it, what is the information entrepreneurs need? And I wanted to kind of give back, really, because I get asked a lot. I get asked... I make a joke of it, but I get asked in the street, I get asked in bars, restaurants, all the time. Yeah. Peers, people stop me in the street and say, well, I've got this business, and they go into it, I'm like, oh, wow, yeah, I've it. got a meeting. Yeah. I'm like, but I'm too nice. I'm yeah. kind of like, well, I'll be late for the meeting, I'll yeah. talk to them in Starbucks, wherever it might be. Like I looked at it, I thought, right, the issue is, is that, and I've, I've done a course which is about you know, starting up and also growing new businesses, but the point is, when I talk to people, there's a lot of information about startups and that kind of culture, not a lot for scale-ups. Yeah. Now, Scale-ups, there's an OECD definition, which is quite tight. And they're quite big businesses, really. It's about a company that's going to grow um, to over 20% a year in employees or revenue, whatever it might be. My definition of a scale-up is anybody who wants to grow their business. Because if you want to grow your business, that means you want to, you're going to take on some risk. If you're taking on risk, that makes you an entrepreneur. And I've got a big believer is that entrepreneurs should be supported. Now, scale-ups, uh, Nest, I'm a trustee of Nest as well, and then there's a big, a big endowment. They did some research, and so is the Scale Up Institute, saying that if you change the number of scale ups in the country by just 1%, it generates a quarter of a million jobs, generates billions in GDP, it changes the dynamics of our, of our economy massively. So, scale ups are the ones that need to be supported right. probably the most. Yeah. And in many ways, they're the ones that are forgotten. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because the, the noise about you know, entrepreneurs being the new rock stars. If you're a mid-market business that's been going for, I don't know, 100 years selling salmon in Scottish Highlands, mm. and you can see a new market in China, now those are the ones actually yeah. that create wealth and employment. Mm. And they're the ones we support. So I kind of started to scale up, it was about trying to raise awareness of that. And also on my various channels is try and provide advice to those kind of companies. Now, yeah. obviously, they get to a point where they don't need my advice. <laughs> they can afford their own advisors. Yeah. But there's a, there's a place in the middle yeah. between the small business and the kind of medium-sized business that don't have that support and access yeah. to um, advisors and don't understand this stuff. So I've been offering them advice. Yeah. And then startup, obviously, is more about the smaller growth businesses. So I've called it cleverly, Startup and scale up. You did that. Great, thank you. Um, what would you say makes a business successful? If you could, you know, you said the three for the <clears throat> PR and the marketing. What three things make a business successful? Depends who you're talking to, doesn't it? Mm. So success can be different between the founder sometimes, even his stakeholders and his customers. So essentially, your business is successful. Let's face it, right, if it makes a, generates a financial profit yeah. or if it generates wealth for the people that invested in it. So people that back a business, your business is different because your success is quite different. You've got no external investors. It's your success is what you and your partner think it is. Yeah. And it might be, you know, be very, very different. The other point about pitching and bringing on capital is the second you sign that dotted line, it changes the dynamics of your business. You now get external people that are giving you money. It might be debt, and they want the money back. Plus interest, yeah. maybe a warrant, and they give you equity. And equity means at some point they want you to pay them lots of dividends that gives them a return, an ROI, or an IPO, or an exit. So that changes the dynamic very different. So those people, at the end of the day, you've got to remember this, venture capital fund, their customer is not you. They're not the mic then. You've got to remember, you've got to venture capital fund, it, the customer's not you, the company. Yeah. The customers, actually, their customers are the limited partners, the pension funds right. that invest in their fund. Yeah. And they want, what they want to do is make the fund work. They'll have one or two companies that fly. They'll have three or four that kind of do okay. They'll have a lot that fail or just, just become what they call the living dead. They can never, they never get out of them. Yeah. And that means then they can go and raise another fund from those investors. So your business, if it doesn't go to plan, they're going to protect the fund and the return and not your business. If they can, if they can take your business to pieces and extract whatever wealth or value they can out of it through receivership or something or liquidation, then they will do that and they're actually yeah. obligated. They're obligated. That's their success. Yeah. So be very careful. So success is typically financial. Now, my view is... Success should be wider than that. Yeah. Success should be about what the founder thinks success is. But actually, I think, and you know, this can be hard to sort of make happen, but what the wider group of stakeholders think, what yeah. the success to your employees look like, mm. what does the success to your customers look like? Because if your employees are happy, your team's happy, and your customers are happy, you're more likely to be successful. Yeah. But let's, not, let's not dance around it. It's about making money. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, you said a bit before, but I want to ask this properly. What's your plan for the future? What, what are you doing When I now? grow up, I would yeah, be. Yeah. Um, Before you get to the big 5-0. Uh, I need the answer to that. Uh, if I'm brutally honest, um, I want to do something big. Yeah, I've done stuff in, I've done tech in, invested in stuff. I've done tech, which is more kind of enterprise tech, really. And I've been looking at various markets. I've been looking at things that interest me. And a point I was trying to make earlier, which I didn't make, was um, looking at things where I can work with people that I want to work with, which is a quite important thing these days. <laughs> so do things I find interesting or that I understand yeah. with people I enjoy doing it with and working with. Yeah. That's been quite important rather than just trying to make money. Yeah. So I've been looking at various markets, you know, from, you know. Is that because you've got enough money now? Well, no, you know, is that because money, you know, age or no, what is you, that? You always got money and you think you've got money and then it gets tied up in, yeah. locked up and then something happens or you lose money yeah. or, you know, you get divorced, whatever it might be. So. I think investing in lower thinking you've got money is a dangerous thing as well. Mm. I think what I want to do now is do something which is sort of disruptive and it's got some scale. I don't, I'm not trying to create the next Facebook or anything like that, but something which actually is a potential to be worth you know, several hundred million, yeah. and which I've created. The problem is I've got in life is people look at me and they think, I'm going to arrive in a helicopter. I'm a billionaire. I haven't got a helicopter. I'm definitely not a billionaire, to yeah. have a fact. Uh, and the point is I want to do something where I don't care if I take customer service calls. I don't care if I have to go and 
you know, like an entrepreneur, take that product around to the customer yeah. because the, because the delivery company messed it up. I want to do that stuff again. Mm. Yeah. So I learn, understand the. So you still love the startup phase. Yeah, I, I just, I'm yeah. not at the point now where, but people think I am. That I want to sort of sit back. I'm also being talking to various companies. And I still haven't quite cracked it yet about joining more boards. Mm. So being a non-exec director, yeah. people look at me and think, uh, "He's on these boards. He doesn't need to do that." And it's just it can be quite frustrating sometimes. Yeah. It's almost like your people sort of look up to you in a way. The BBC created a monster. It's not me. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So I want to get involved. Right. And build something, my bare hands from scratch, but something which I understand, which has got potential for real scale. Yeah, and I, I'm actually working on a few of those. Okay, so, so I'm doing my, I'm going through my own, my own course. I'm doing the research, yeah. talking to people, and I've learned a lot actually as I get older. Putting your own pitch deck together. Put my own pitch deck. <laughs> I was doing that over the weekend, <laughs> literally. So, but the point is, is that it's going to need more capital eventually. This thing that I, I've got, that I can put into it. So that's what I want to do. We'll have to do a. Um, a part two when that's all going big and wherever else well, you ho- again, put a pitch on that. Again, it's the hypothesis, isn't it? Because yeah. again, my thing is, is that people think, well, Piers is doing that. Wow. Yeah. Wait, I, I don't know. I'm, yeah. I'm looking at it. So I'm looking at a kind of a blue ocean strategy. And if you've read the book or anything yeah. like that, so yeah. I'm looking at blue ocean, so I'm looking at markets which have incumbents and saying, how can you leverage technology yeah. and the entrepreneurial sort of ethic and look at that market and do something differently, which adds more value for customers yeah. that are bored with the way they've been treated for the last 20 years. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I have four fairly quick answer questions left. I want to try something new, and that's just talk a bit about more about randomly you and what you're into. So the first thing I noticed about you when you came in, other than you look more muscly than I thought you would look. Yeah. Um, what about that guy, though? <laughs> he's, no, he's, no, he's leaner. Like, you're like, like, he's, like, he's like a lean starter. You're, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, is, you're wearing a McQueen shirt. I am, uh, yeah. And someone tipped me not, off, Not many people noticed that. Yeah, yeah. Someone tipped me off. Someone said, oh, you know, Piers is quite into McQueen. And I just wanted to explore that and ask you about that. So, you know, are you interested in the brand? Have you got any link? Have you seen the documentary? I talk about that all the time because I watched that two days before my 40th well, I saw birthday. the documentary. I went to the v uh, exhibition as well. And yeah. I also was ended up, with, people who recognise me the most are uh, probably cabbies. Right. Well, cabbies were chatting away and he, yeah. was, he was a family, a quite close family. Yeah. To McQueen and they were chatting away and that was a random conversation. Right. Um, so I like lots of designers, but I, I, I like these shirts. I've, I've got so many of these shirts. Yeah. It's funny, actually. I, I keep seeing them and buying the same thing. Yeah. And people look at me and say, is that a holster? <laughs> yeah, is that a gun I kind holster? Of, I kind of think, I've had that. Actually, that's probably where, yeah. uh, that's obviously where it so, came from. Someone put a picture of one of those guys from the, um, no, the office, where he actually had a gun holster on. Yeah. Um, and it actually did look like a McQueen shirt. A, yeah. So I get asked that one a lot. Is that, is you that wearing a, a backpack? Is that a holster or what? <laughs> yeah. I'm like, um, no, so yeah, I like that particular brand. Yeah, uh, but I haven't really, I haven't really gone mad on that stuff uh, the last for a while actually. No. I've been quite casual. I've been, I started a company with the Affertons, Afferton Bikes. So I'm into yeah. mountain biking, so they're the world champions. They've won probably five, six between them. Right, and uh, they're like you know two million followers on social media. Yeah, Mitch was nearly Sportswoman of the Year a few times. Right. And um, I've been wearing their hoodie yeah. <laughs> mostly. Nice. Mostly if I turn up to places in the hoodie. I did. A, I was in London. Um, I don't live in London at the moment. I live in the Northwest. Yeah. I was in London a couple of weeks ago. I went to two meetings in my Atherton's hoodie, and both times at reception, I actually tweeted about it. Oh, really? They, they, they said, uh, "They said, are you here to deliver? Are you here to deliver or collect?" <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Oh, okay." So yeah. So my mountain bike is my thing I love doing. I'm most happy going yeah. on a bike. I just don't do it often enough. Right, and then that's the sort of thing that clears your head and all that, is it? Yeah. I mean, my partner, she always says to me, "I always look the happiest." Yeah. And I've just got off a bike. Yeah. And that might be a 40 mile ride around where I live. It yeah. might be mountain biking. Um, but I, just, I don't do it enough. I haven't. Yeah. See, we're actually still developing the bikes. So they're going to be launched quite soon. But I'm just dying to get my hands on one of our own bikes. Yeah. The, so these are, to give you an idea of technologists, these are, most bikes are like, you know, tubes, welds, yeah. or carbon fiber. It's all laid out in Taiwan normally. Yeah. It takes months. So these are 3D printed joints in titanium. Right. With carbon fibre tubes. Wow. So the, 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 the Affertons, this is a G and Rachel, have been racing this year. They'll, uh, Dan as well, they'll race. I think well, that's not quite right. They'll come back to us and we'll tweak the CAD drawing, reproduce the, um, the lugs they call the joints, tubes in, create a whole frame in a week. It usually takes a couple of months. Right. We've been able to iterate the design very, very quickly yeah. to get the product to market. 
Huh? These are like, you know, the high-end mountain bikes. We're going to yeah. eventually do all sorts of bikes. A question people ask me a lot, and I think it's probably just because of me, but I'm fascinated by this. Um, and I've never asked this to anyone on the podcast before, but meditation is getting quite big. Yeah. Um, do you meditate? Have you tried meditation? And if you do or don't, what other things work for you to rest, clear your head, you know, not go insane, yeah. whatever So else. I talk a lot about, you know, building businesses, about, you know, your wellness, yeah. being mental, physical. So I have at times, I get really in the zone. So I'm in the gym, you know, every morning, up at half six, I'm training, yeah. I'm riding my bike to get the calorie count up during the day. And there'll be other times, and, and that, to me on a bike, that's when, because I'm quite manic, and mum will always say to me, stop shaking your leg. You know, I'm always <laughs> like doing something. Yeah. And when I'm on a bike though, I can ride 100 miles on my own, and, and all you're doing really is thinking. Yeah. That's my kind of zone. I don't really, when I was younger, I was quite into sort of um, visualization, and I could hypnotize myself, so I've, yeah. I've done all that. But I don't meditate in such as a, as a true sense of that. So it's more active meditation. It's more being in, in, in a zone. Yeah. I wouldn't say the gym is quite like that. It's more on bikes, I think. Yeah. I don't mean downhill mountain biking either, because I haven't got time to think of anything. Yeah. It's like staying on the bike and not going to hospital. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's more about if I'm doing like some road cycling or cycle across. Yeah. So that's something I, I can do. That. But the last year, I haven't been very good at that. So that that's a, it's a horse I need to get back onto. Yeah. I, I've been a little bit sort of frazzled about you know doing what I'm going to do, working on a couple of businesses. I've, I've worked on some stuff in wellness. I thought, yeah. nah, is that gonna work? And I've been a bit frazzled. And what I'm lacking at the minute, and I always say, you need discipline. And I think it sounds boring. You need a routine. Yes, yeah. You need discipline and a routine. Yeah. And that that gives you a foundation. On top of that, you can go and do what the hell you want and go crazy. Yeah. But discipline and routine about the basics. I'm lacking at the minute. Right. And because I'm, I'm between the Northwest and London a lot, I'm sort of, oh, how do I get to the gym? Yeah. Where's my bike? So yeah, I haven't been great for the last 12 months on that. I need to sort it out. Yeah. I don't necessarily think everyone needs to Do you to meditate? Uh, well, I've tried it a few times and I'm impatient. I imagine my, my leg's always going yeah. and yeah. all of that kind of stuff. So my brain's always on. Um, and I, I want to get more into it. I, I do walking meditations now. I learned them off Dr. Joe Dispenza. And so I walk around, I do calls, I do my WhatsApp, and then I have like maybe 15, 20 minutes to myself. This is all walking around where I live, looking yeah. at all the houses, because I just love looking at properties, always have. I love the meditating whilst doing WhatsApp. Exactly, I know. <laughs> I'm sure this is, this yeah. is, I'm getting there. Yeah. But I always have sort of 15 minutes visualization, trying to clear my mind, that kind of thing. And, and it has really helped. Um, for me, sitting down and doing the whole this thing for a while, I'm not there yet. I can see the benefit, I have tried it, but. I think getting in flow, doing things you love, like I love vinyl uh, and I've built yeah, this hi-fi yeah. system since I was 14 year old, con con 14 years old, constantly upgrading and I love vinyl and I could sit there and listen to vinyl and what it, you could be shooting at me and the companies could be taken mm -hmm. from me and someone could be upstairs in the bedroom banging my missus and I just wouldn't care, mm -hmm. it'd all be fine, I'd just be like there and I think sometimes there's a lot of this you've got to meditate you know there's a lot of that around be mindful be quiet have lots of quiet don't t go on your iPhone but sometimes riding a bike going for a walk listen find your own thing that I think visualize to me visualization I mean I've always done that naturally yeah and I think you can do that anywhere cleaning on the toilet yeah you <laughs> so can you, yeah, yeah. So you can visualization I think is yeah. I don't mean sort of like just imagine yourself sitting on a throne in a private jet yeah that kind of nonsense but just that step by step, right? Who do you want to be, and yeah. where do you see your business? And just being able to use your mind and yeah. put things in there, sort of down, up, upload it almost. Because yeah. your brain, obviously, is a lot is a lot better than PowerPoint. So yeah. if you can get it up there and assimilate it, and then use it in that way, I, I've always used visualization. But probably just I've just done it at sort of a matter of course. That's yeah. the way I think. I'm very visual. People say to me, Piers, well, how are you going to do that?" I'm like, I draw it. Yeah. I don't write it out normally. Yeah, the thing about that as well, I think, which is really good, because I started doing that after I read Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill in 2005. Um, and I started doing all the visualizations. Doing lots of books. And the, yeah, loads. Yeah. And the inc incantations and all of that. And I have my own mantra of like nine words that I repeat over and over and do the visualization. But the thing I think it really helps with is controlling your thoughts. Because if you think about you just sitting there, your brain just subconsciously chucks a million fears and yeah. worries and doubts. And, but you visualizing, Yes, it's the visualization element, but it's also I'm stopping all the unconscious programming yeah. and all the fear and the doubt and the noise, which naturally comes in. Because when you I meditate, find, yeah. that, all, that all reigns yeah. in, doesn't it? 
I think visualization can do it anywhere. Yeah. I think you can sit on the tune. We can do it walking. You can sit on the tune, boss, wherever you are, your car, and just yeah. do it. But I, I find it hard to switch off. Yeah. That's what I struggle with sometimes. Yeah. I think that's really common in entrepreneurs, isn't yeah. it? Proper ones. I, I find myself emailing people, and in the morning, they're like, Please, why are we emailing at 4 30 in the morning? <laughs> yeah. Like, oh my God, was it 4 30 <laughs> yeah. in the morning? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I get that I all get the time. I get told off of that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, so do you find, uh, do you find the idea of sitting there, your legs crossed, doing this? Do you find that something weird or something? No, I'd, just... I'd like to, I'd like, to, I think there are levels of mastery in meditation. I'd like to be able to control my thoughts more and quiet my mind more. And I have done it because I'm really busy just sitting there and thinking about making the time to essentially do nothing and to practice that, to get the mind quiet. Um, I guess I've always found something else to do. So a walking meditation or a visualization or an incantation to me seems to be a bit of a better hack because I can fit it into my day. Yeah. But to, like you said, though, it's not much, is it, to put a 10 minutes in your diary and do it. So that's my next level. But I'm kind of getting there. People, but people go to the gym for that, I think. I yeah. Know, it's kind of real. Yeah, you, yeah. you can zone out, actually. But this was the point I want to make, because everyone's talking about meditation, like doing nothing and quiet in your thoughts, but being in flow and doing things that... Or having, put, right, I've got to do three reps, three sets, yeah. that's what I've got to do. And all your that's active meditation, because you're focused it. on that. And everything else is And you're taking out. all your stress and putting it into yeah. your weight. So, so I think that has merit as well. So the most important question I have to ask you is, have you ever had lobster roll at Burger Lobster? No, I hate lobster. I hate, I, hate any, I, hate any, I hate any food, typically, that's a, a sort of crustacean or a walk sideways. You have definitely <laughs> walks. You, <laughs> so, <laughs> like, I had my first lobster roll with Kieran Richardson, uh, who's a good friend of mine. He, he buys watches for me. He used to play for Man U, and he took me to Burger and Lobster and got me into lobster roll. And it was like, it was like orgasm while you're eating. I've never had, I, well, I don't like crab, lobster, cockles, winkles. Yeah, even but no, this is not, no, no, people, no, say, you, people say, go on, the, go on celebrity to get me out of it. I'm like, I can only eat frozen prawns. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I'm which did you grow up? <laughs> you, you need to go to Burger and Lobster and just try the lobster roll right. and just... What's, what is lobster roll? It's like, guys, what is it? I mean, Harry and Kieran, we, we, it's yeah. our, our thing now, see the converse, we're going after, faces, yeah. our thing now after a podcast yeah. is to go to Burger and Lobster yeah. if we're in London. How could you even explain it? Beautiful brioche bun, which is toasted. They get those nice thick lobster, filled with a roll full of lobster, balanced sandwich, brilliant. <laughs> the, most the most, that's his pitch, what is yeah. it? It's the most balanced sandwich <laughs> yeah. you ever going to eat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. You've got to try I'll, it. I'll try it, but yeah. I'm not promising that. It, no, right, it okay. doesn't, t it, like, for what people perceive lobster is, it doesn't taste like it. It tastes like, it's, it's like a very meaty. Mm. Just the best thing you've ever eaten in your life. It's only 20 quid. Oh, we're going, we're going see, my, see, my favourite food is flying fish, which you can't get it here now, it's only no. in Barbados, but I like yeah. fish, but I like... Fish in Barbados. Most of my food has got, got a yeah. spine in it. Yeah. So. Oh, anyway, I just had that. I'm going to have to ask everyone that now, burger and lobster. All right, cool. So our four finishing questions then. What's the best advice you've ever been given? Oh, my God. Um, four. I've been given lots of good advice. Recently, when I was young. Up to you. I think it's quite corny, but I think it is, it is you hear it a lot, and it can be quite annoying, but it is, do something that you enjoy doing. And I, I've done things in the past that I don't really enjoy doing it. I've kid myself, because you can make money out of it, and yeah. I've made money out of it. Yeah. But I've done things where you have made money. And I can't believe the quote I found, I did a quote, on my social media a while ago about you can do something you hate doing and it goes wrong. So you may as well do something you love doing which can go wrong yeah, as well. Yeah. So that's the point is do you spend your life doing something that actually matters to you. Yeah. I'm not going to say, you know, if you love what you do, you're never going to do day's work because you are going to yeah. put a flipping day's work in, trust me. But I think that's really important and, and do it with people that actually you want to work with. I think that's a really good... It took me a long time to learn. Yeah, it, People are always asking me what's the quickest way or the best way to make money. And they don't want to hear this answer, but the answer is find something you enjoy doing. That's probably the best and quickest way. Forget some flippant, transient opportunity. Do something you really enjoy. You're going well, to do it for longer. It's also a lot of people, they, they, they get lost in the, especially if you raise money. So you get lost in the, I've got to build a business to sell it or IPO it, especially right. sell it. Yeah. And the point is, is if you build an amazing business, 
it will make money, hopefully, yeah. or somebody's going to want to buy it. Yeah. So that's the thing. Focus on building a, an amazing business, something you enjoy doing, you're proud of. And the chance that if you do that, they'll be more successful yeah. and more valuable and more likely you're going to flog it. If you say, right, in four years, I'm going to sell this business to X large company and I'm going to build it in a way I think they're going to want to buy it, you know, you're never going to know what big companies, are going, what they're thinking. Yeah. And that could be a mistake. Yeah. There's a lot of entrepreneurs looking at the exit rather than the, the, the entry. Yeah. Okay. What's the worst advice you've ever been given? Oh, God. Um, God, I'm getting lost. The problem is, you're giving bad advice, it's bad advice you listen to. I think some of the worst advice is about hiring people. Is, um, I, you, you meet people and you, they go through a process, and you, I always met people at the end, and I'd be like, no, don't, no, they're, they're not right for this business. Something not quite right. And everyone's going, no peers, you know, we understand them, they know what they're doing, hire them. They've hired lots of people and lots of advice saying this person knows their stuff, they're from big company X, and I've hired them. And my gut reaction has always been not to take them on board, and then I've regretted it. Yeah. So usually it's people, I think, that have right. messed things up. Yeah. And I think the important point for anyone listening to this is or watching this is that gut reactions work. So the point is, if someone, if you've got a, a if you've got a lifetime experience in a particular industry, and someone comes to you and asks you a question about it, you can have a gut reaction because your internal computer takes that data, cross-references it against your history, and then comes out of an answer without even think about it. Like Malcolm Gladwell, sort of yeah. blinging that. Um, if you don't have a clue what you're talking about in the industry and you, and you have a gut reaction, don't listen to it. Mm. And I've done mm. a lot of things where I've had a lot of experience and I've had a gut reaction, and does that make sense? Yeah. But I've had lots of things where I've had a gut reaction and then not... Well, I've known what I'm talking about and not listen to it. Right. And then often in terms of people. Yeah. Okay. Two more. Um, is there any one thing that's really wrong in the world that if you could, you'd like to change it? What the hell? There's a lot of things wrong in the world. I think that um, simplistically, I'll go back to it again, is the thing about business should be a force for good. It's that all the public costs should be factored into the private costs products and services and then we've got a more symbiotic system yeah. where there are fewer people that are left behind yeah okay and then this podcast is called the disruptive entrepreneur so um what does the word disruptive mean to you well i'm actually trying to do that now so to me i'm trying to i'm looking at various markets and trying to work out a way to disrupt them which is i'm not trying to reinvent them or create new ones was trying to find a way, I'm using a blue ocean strategy approach to it really, yeah. trying to find a way to disrupt the incumbents. So yes, take their customers off them and offer them a service or solution in a way in which they just can't. Yeah. So that's just going to disrupt them or disintermediate in some cases, yeah. but disrupt them in terms of they can't do it because of the way they are, the way they think, the way they operate. But if you're an entrepreneur these days and you leverage technology, you can disrupt a lot of big companies the point to remember, and actually a founder of um, a fintech company recently said to me, which is a good point he made, is that you can be disruptive, but a lot of the challenger banks. You can be disruptive and think you're being disruptive. You're disrupting the big guys, the incumbents. But do not underestimate the big guys, the incumbents. I've done that in the past. They have a lot of money, yeah. a lot of time, a lot of resource. Yeah. And when they say, oh, hang on a minute, he's disrupting yeah. us. <laughs> yeah. And they throw that at you. They can slowly, it might be all tanker speed, but unless you're moving at jet ski speed, yeah. they're going to run you over. Yeah. And often that's what can happen. You've got to be disruptive in a way where there is clear water. You are doing things that doesn't matter what they try and do in this large organisation. I'm talking about disrupting existing markets here. Yeah. Uh, they can never do what you are doing because it's, it's not in their DNA. Yeah. not in their makeup to do it or to do it that way. Okay. Um, maybe we should add this one on each podcast as well. I just thought of this, but um, if there's one person you think I should, sorry, what does disruptive? Sorry, go back. To, sorry, that's sorry, all right. No, go for what does disruptive mean to you? I mean, the fact it's on your t-shirt. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, so disruptive means to me. If you're in property, um, essentially a lot of what you're in training. Yeah. Which can be hard to be disruptive in those markets sometimes because how do yeah. you disrupt? Well, I think it means offering newer, better, faster solutions to older, slower. Yeah. existing problems. I think it means taking risks. 
Um, I think disruption is often overlooked about disruption to yourself and your own organization. It's often looking at a lazy market, a greedy market, an oversaturated market or whatever. But actually, um, how are you growing as an individual? How are you challenging yourself? How are you developing your strengths? What team are you building around you? How are you managing your emotions? Because I think one of the hardest things in business is managing your emotions. Yeah. Um, and business has actually been the best teacher for me of managing my emotions. I could never shut my gob. Uh, like, okay, I've got, I'm quite loud and I talk a lot, but I shut my gob for 95% of the things I want to say because I don't want to lose money, and I don't want to lose staff, and I don't want to lose customers. Yeah. And if I said what I felt all day, every day, I'd probably have none of them left. <laughs> right. um, because, you know, people are like attacking you all the time. People are, you know, when you have quite a big staff, there's some that are under productive or maybe some that are, you know, maybe I've had people set up against me a lot, which every business yeah. owner has. So I suppose disruptive means staying one step ahead of yourself and one step ahead of your industry or your market or your model. I think it's kind of nice and fun to be a little like you said, a little attacker of a, a big business or a lazy industry. But I don't think you should do that for the sake of it. And I agree with you what you say. Sometimes you pick a fight with the wrong freaking company, which can be dumb. Um, actually, the reason we called this podcast The Disruptive Entrepreneur is because quite a few years ago, we were looking for a brand for me because I wanted to develop my personal brand a bit. I mean, I'm not involved in my properties anymore operationally or even at a management level. Um, and everyone said that was the word that, seem to yeah. describe me the best so we just kind of went with it because yeah. it has a different word word in tech and in business yeah. to i think the way i see it um, well i think tech yeah. is the biggest disruptor there yeah it doesn't matter what you do yeah maybe a corner shop you can you know access a much bigger market in new yeah. ways um you, if you're you know the things like truva things like that where you can be a, a small sort of homewares business and yeah access a global market so tech's the the main disruptor it's a question of how you yeah. leverage that in a way in which works for you in your business yeah and important to add to that because i'd agree is just because tech's the biggest disruptor doesn't mean if you're a mom and pop or you're a lifestyle business you can't be disruptive either or be a disruptor if you no, do totally. what you do better than everyone else yeah. you're you're a disruptor yeah you can be a disruptor to your local market right yeah. but also the thing is about technology going back to the earlier conversation about going from linear to exponential change is the disruptors are being disrupted the yeah. difference is, is that they've got the money now right. to buy the disruptors of yeah. the disruptors. <laughs> yeah. It's all getting quite confusing. Yeah, this is like, um, what is it, Vanilla Sky or the Matrix <laughs> yeah. or something. Yeah, so that's the problem. They just see, they see WhatsApp and Facebook, they see WhatsApp or Instagram rising. Bam. Yeah. They just go and have a cup of coffee down in Silicon Valley and offer them a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so where can we follow you? What, you know, what, what do you want? Viewers and listeners, if you've got your online course or anything like that, you can shout out. So I'm on most social media now. So Twitter's at Piers Linney. Uh, the course, so look Didn't at you that. Spell your last name just in case. Uh, so it's L I N N E Y. So yeah. Piers, P I E R S. Uh, the course is go to startupwithpeerslinney.com. Yeah. And uh, I'll, put a, I'll put a discount code on there for people listening or watching. Right. Uh, so that's kind of something I've, I've done and I'm, I want people to use it. Yeah. So I'm kind of looking at the pricing and I've kind of brought it down and more people, people are accessing it now yeah that's quite important to do but really by any social media all you really want at the end of the day is people to engage with you yeah to listen to what you're putting out there and uh what's your main profile and, and, and you comment in the comments below yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly and subscribe to my youtube channel because i need some subscribers yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah actually just quickly on that before we go then social media um where do you see it do you want to do you want to build up your personal brand is that something you're into what do you think of that whole personal brand um, space oh. I've got a personal brand already. It was kind of mm. created for me. It's a question of what do I do with it? So yeah. part of me is giving back. It's about offering advice, you know, the startup, the scale up, and then and supporting entrepreneurs and champion SMEs, which is yeah. something I want to do. And my position allows me to do that. Um, but also, I'm actually, the businesses I'm looking at increasingly are focused on that market as well. So it is championing and trying to create value for small businesses. Because yeah. small businesses are, they're notoriously hard to access because, you know, what is a small business? Yeah. It's a small business owner and they can be, you know, gay, straight, any religion, you know, fat, thin, they can be a whole diversity of people that own small businesses. And it's very, very hard for people to access. And so I'm trying to come up with a way of disrupting yeah. um, the markets that are focused on small businesses because they're the businesses that I actually care about. Yeah. I think we're good. Is that all right? I think we're good. That was really good. So I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, it's good. Yeah. I think we talked for hours. Thank you, Piers. Cover lots yeah. of ground. Yeah. 
Um, the most important thing for me is that you enjoy it. So if you enjoy it, then... Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. How long do you reckon that lasted? I don't know. Nearly two hours. Is it? Two hours, yeah. Oh, I'm going to do this. But this did, yeah. <laughs> did, I, did I sense when to end it or did I get, go too no, long? No, it's like you, you could pick any subject there and do a whole podcast about yeah. it. Yeah. Like the future of work, um, technology, you know, AI. Uh, we, we've almost got, I mean, we'll keep it as one, but for future, we can break this up into two parts, can't we? Because all the stuff before the pitching and then... Yeah, yeah, There's one, one I did as well, which we haven't even covered it, um, on um, my YouTube actually about scale-up, so about the five factors. I do a lot of talks on that, actually, mm. about have a plan, uh, have operationals, uh, people, your team, finance and technology. Right. So there's lots of stuff yeah. you could do. Are you, have you done many podcasts? No, so I've done I've done a series with Nat West. Yeah, so I did that. Mm. I've just done a video series actually, which right. is rolling out now. Oh, my dad did a full page and telegraphed. Wow, to support everyone, nuts. Um, and I've just I did a couple recently, but not I've not really. It's a great. I mean, it's so hard to get me. There's some big podcasts room. out there, and that's a great way to build a load of followers. I mean, yeah. if you get on two or three big podcasts, you get thousands. Who are the big ones like? Uh, well, the biggest ones are probably Joe Rogan's. Oh, the, the really big ones. Um, but in the UK, there's a lot of quite. Um, Evans got one. Is it Evans? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there are quite a few good bis- big business ones. Just look in the charts. Yeah, look, look, yeah. Um, but I've started listening to them more. I didn't really yeah. uh, listen to a few. I love podcasts. I've started listening to them more, actually. And podcasts, mm. as you know, you know, YouTube video is a flipping nightmare. Yeah. Like editing it and getting it up there. Yeah. This podcast. The problem is there's a lot of them. Mm. They can proliferate. So. Mm. There's a lot of noise in podcasts. Yeah. But, I mean, I think the British ones are good to listen to because there's less ads and you get different... I always try and get different guests. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, there's a certain amount of people who just do the podcast circuit. Nothing wrong with that. I could get some of those. I just like to have very different guests. Yeah. yeah. yeah I haven't done that many, now. And the, the NetWest stuff was more... They were really good, actually. They've got some good people in there. All right. Yeah. It's on the, I'll send you a link to it. But Did you host it or... Well, so it's my podcast, but it's just sponsored by my right. wife. Oh. So, yeah, yeah. So I've done quite a few things. I've done for Cisco. So a lot yeah. of big brands mm. asked me to do podcasts and video series because they want to talk to SMEs. Right. And that's really how I monetize social media, yeah. which wasn't which was completely unexpected. Yeah. Was, they'll just pay you like a one-off fee to do that? Yeah, basically. All right. So we've got to pick the brands. Of course. I get a lot of brands. I'm like, oh. What, as in just for association point of view? Yeah, I just, I just, yeah, I just can't be asked. Mm. Or they're just trying to take the mickey or they want too much for it. Or yeah. they think you're some kind of like influencer. I'm like, no. Nah. People, have been, I get contact all the time. Oh, can you do one thing here and a tweet and a thing will give you fucking X thousand? I'm like, no. Nah. Yeah. No. Nah. I don't mind doing like a series. And mm. then that West is doing one now, the video series is a proper sort of, you know, TV almost panel format with three right. people and the podcasts were. We should look into that. I didn't, I didn't know about that. Yeah, the podcasts yeah. are really good. So that's on their um, Rethinking Business, uh, Nat West Hub, right. Nat West Business Hub. And that was like the founder of Made.com, yeah. Susie Ma. Um, really good series, actually. actually mm. I actually learned quite a lot. Talking, it's quite funny. They come, it's a great thing about podcasts. They turn up with all the people with their script go up here. They've got a script here. What are you talking yeah. about? And I'm like, well, okay, give it here. And I sit down, I'm like, well, okay. And we yeah. talk. Yeah. At the end of it, I say, right. Anything that needs to cover that? No, no, we covered it all. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite funny. <laughs> they tell me what the yeah. script, like, yeah. yeah. So they've been, they've been really good. A few entrepreneurs, uh, I took a good few things away from, mm. a few pointers away from. Yeah. They're quite disruptors. And found a he said to me, uh, one of them, he said to me, to do what you know. Yeah. Which is quite a good one. Mm. And I was thinking at the time, I was like, I've been looking at wellness. And I'm like, yeah. you know, well, you're putting into wellness, aren't you? But it's, it's all right, wellness, but it's, um, a lot of the companies you look at, you know, it might be some vegan fungal based yogurt, <laughs> you know, which is amazing and yeah. they're very passionate about it. But the market's two million and that's the end of it. Yeah. So how much money can you put into it? And you can do you can do what you know for fifteen years and then the first time you do what you don't know and you lo- you lose and ruin everything because you think you you know everything. Well, I've done things I don't know, but not me running it. Mm. I've invested in it or like the Affertons, you know, they they had a dream for a bike company and uh, and if, I didn't know them, they pushed me on Instagram. Well, yeah. I start a bike company, you can help us. I'm like, oh, God. So I met them and we ended up with a bike company that's, oh, right. that's won three World Cups on, 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 on a prototype. Yeah. So, and are you, are you like funding a lot of that? Um, some, some of them I do, but some of them I just, I'm a founder. Mm. 
And then we get like, external money. Mm. And increasingly, you should have um, used external finance, really. Yeah. Because um, <laughs> if you can, that's the way to do it. Yeah. But some things you do small, do my own. Yeah. But some of the things are quite big. Mm. You know, they're talking millions. Or yeah. Ten to tens of millions, some of them. Yeah. So. All right. Thank you very much. So you, you guys do this full time? What was the? Well, no. No. Um, I have a trading business. Yeah. Um, so you do lots of stuff back like in that. Peterborough, but we're doing this more and more, aren't we? I mean, this will yeah. be about episode four hundred and fifteen. So it's quite a lot of wow, episodes. Is many, is yeah. Look at that. Yeah, been doing it for um, four years. Is it four years? Four years in January. So you do one a, one a week? How many do you do? Two a week. Two a week. One interview That's every a couple of. of weeks. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it's mm. just my content. Yeah. I just sort of fill in the gaps because, you know, I don't just want to do interviews because I also want to build my own yeah. brand. Yeah. You've you got a LinkedIn video. How's that going? Sorry? The link, LinkedIn video. LinkedIn Live, yeah. <clears> I got on that straight away and the, and the reach was probably about 10 times Facebook Live. Yeah. Um, I haven't done one for quite a while other than these little is it, bits. Is it just because I've been fucking busy. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty good. It gets better reach than the Facebook lives. Um, I've got a third of the followers on LinkedIn, but I get about five times the reach on LinkedIn. Yeah. So it's about 15 times as effective. LinkedIn's the last bastion, isn't it? It'll soon be, a, it'll soon be just a mess as yeah. well. Like any of the social media channel. Yeah, but I mean, the good, it's, you, you get a lot more organic reach, don't you, if you get, get the posts right. Yeah. Um, I should, we should do more on LinkedIn. We don't focus on it enough. Well, yeah, it's like everything. We're trying to do the podcast, YouTube, I, Facebook. I, I, I don't do Facebook. Facebook's like the big one, but I just don't do anything on Facebook. I've probably, got, probably got like a hundred followers on Facebook. Well, I just, yeah. Just well, if you're not bothered, you're not bothered. I think if I do this business, I'll probably gear it up, leverage Ooh. it up, because it's kind of relevant. But like you say, I've got my partner, she's got a Martin to be, she does it, and you people do the videos and that, but like you say, the amount of time, you can get lost into social media. Yeah. Well, it's yeah, Kieran's full time yeah, job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I spend probably a third of my week on it. Um, we've got like a social media agency now, just a little bit bespoke baby one. We've got like d- d- two dozen clients, and we've got a podcast one, which has got about 100 clients. But yeah, you spend all your, all your day on social media. But. Oh, really? Yeah. My dog got two daughters, and I was so pissed off that she was uh, 11 years old. And she goes, Dad, it's advert on TikTok for flipping FaceTune. I was like, no, on TikTok, they have... Just, just, like, like, oh, my God. So just, it, is a, it, is a, uh, it is a platform that promotes stuff that you really can... Not, yeah. not, not for 11-year-old girls, no. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he likes... That's, he likes, that's what they target, yeah. Uh, totally. Yeah. She gets the ads, she shows me. the videos. She shows me the ads, it's like... Yeah. And, yeah, it's a 50% platform where that's going. But actually, Instagram are going to take everything that TikTok do... And nick and it. put it onto their own platform. Have Instagram bought it then or something? No, they're just no. copying it. Oh, right. that's, that's my point about the, the big disruptors. Mm. They either buy you or just yeah. do what you're doing. Look at they YouTube. Bring, but, yeah, YouTube yeah. are doing stories now, aren't they? Yeah, YouTube are doing yeah. stories. It's like, it's like, you don't want to be, I don't know, you don't want to be hey, that, that, social media dog. Mm. This is this is last day. Oh my god, my mortgage. I can't even remember what I was going to say. From now on, Piers Liddy is doing a Rob's podcast. That's good. Whatever. Yeah, social media moves quick, really quick. I like that about it. We've missed a few boats on social media. I'm really annoyed. But like what, like. Well, when YouTube got big, I missed that. When Instagram yeah. got big, I missed YouTube's that. YouTube's a hard one now. Facebook. But, um, supporters? Mm, yeah, the Facebook supporters going really well. Which one's 2,075 that? people who subscribe to my Facebook support program. What is that, like a... They just pay out a monthly fee and then I just do more exclusive, unique yeah, yeah, yeah. content or meetups and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the paid... Like, content's always had to be free for the last 20 years. But I do see a shift now with you getting paid for content. So I, the, I say, if you buy the course, I've got a private Facebook group. Yeah. But I haven't really done much in it yet. <laughs> it's like, oh, God. Yeah. They take admin, but they, it is worth it. We get a lot of good lifetime client value out of our Facebook groups. I've got a WhatsApp group. That's, that, I, did, I started like last week. I just went, boom. But oh, WhatsApp is just not designed for scale. It's not. It's, if you've got like a corner shop with 20 people, you're fine. You try mm. and talk to a thousand people on WhatsApp, even WhatsApp business, yeah. and the list takes 256, and 
Hey, yeah, it's all manual. You'd have to write some software, the API, to do it properly. Yeah. Fuck, which I can't be asked doing. Yeah. <laughs> but the, that's why. It's a theme for you, isn't it? Can't be asked. <laughs> it's, it's, can't, it's like, well, what's the, what's the value? Mm. So if, yeah. if you had a, if I, if I do this business and I'm setting out and I'm trying to talk to SMEs, then I'll integrate that into that. Mm. But for me to write some, a platform on top of Facebook, uh, yeah. what's that business? Yeah, and then you're beholden to them, aren't you? And what well, if they the change? Thing. Yeah. So it's just a tricky one, what's that? Mm. But it's quite good because it's kind of quite personal, I think. Yeah. Yeah, we use, I've got about seven WhatsApp groups I manage. And on the downside, it's just total nightmare because of all the messages. But on the upside, you get people very close and connected. So I'm watching so you, that actually do it, you actually do it in a group, do you? I've done a broadcast, haven't I? Yeah, I did in, in a group. group. And after that, oh, God. Yeah, another thing, you'd have to, they like, all day, yeah. you just... I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm like a guy, you know, the old guy in the bar with four phones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah no, no, we go, we go full in on all this. That they can all message. We get people very close and connected. The, the challenge is scale, but you create community, and I think when you create community online, you win because yeah. you get really good will. Yeah, we'll see. It's early mm. days. Are you in London or are you back up north now? No, I'm going to do this talk now on uh, AI and compliance. All right. <laughs> in, I was, um, in, I was in, 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 in Horsham. No, I've got to go to Horsham now. I've actually got to write my speech. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I kind of did it on the train in my we head. We should start inviting the guests to come with us to Bergen and Lobster, should we? Do you promise? You should add a little bit. Yeah. Do you promise me you'll try it? Yeah, I'll try it. Yeah. yeah well, I'll give it a go. Lobster roll. It doesn't taste like lobster. lobster. No, no, it tastes like heaven. Really? Really? Like I said, it's the most balanced. Amazing sandwich. sandwich I've ever had. Full stop. I'm in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah he, he does. He yeah. gets so excited he about it. it. Yeah. Yeah, you, should, you should do a little trip down there and we'll sit down <laughs> yeah. with the sandwich. Okay, I'll try it. Yeah. It's good to meet you. Yeah, you too. Thanks it's a lot, very interesting. It took, it took some time. Yeah. Got there in the end. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, please. If Actually, I can yeah. help you with anything, yeah. social media, podcast, so you're, whatever. You're, you're honestly, I'm kind of playing at it, really. Yeah.